Introduction to the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shane Greenup The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius by Marcus Aurelius Antoninus Translated by George Long Introduction Marcus Arnius Verus was born in Rome in A.D. 121 and assumed the name of Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, by which he is known to history on his adoption by the Emperor T. Aurelius Antoninus. He succeeded to the imperial throne in 161 and ruled till his death in 180. His reign, though marked by justice and moderation at home, was troubled by constant warfare on the frontiers of the empire and Aurelius spent much of his later years in the uncongenial task of commanding armies that no longer proved irresistible against the barbarian hordes. M. Aurelius was educated by the orator Fronto, but turned aside from rhetoric to study of the Stoic philosophy, of which he was the last distinguished representative. The meditations, which he wrote in Greek, are among the most noteworthy expressions of this system, and exhibit it favourably on its practical side. His own precepts he carried out with singular consistency, and both in his public and his private life he was in the highest degree conscientious. He and his predecessor are noted as the only Roman emperors who can be said to have ruled with a single eye to the welfare of their subjects. During his reign Rome was visited by a severe pestilence, and this, with reverses suffered by his armies, threw the populace into a panic and led them to demand the sacrifice of the Christians whom they regarded as having brought down the anger of the gods. Aurelius seems to have shared the panic, and his record is stained by his sanction of the cruel persecution. This incident in the career of the last and one of the loftiest of the pagan moralists may be regarded as symbolic of the dying effort of heathenism to check the advancing tide of Christianity. The meditations picture with faithfulness the mind and character of this noblest of the emperors, Simple in style and sincere in tone, they record for all time the height reached by pagan aspirations in its effort to solve the problem of conduct, and the essential agreement of his practice with his teaching proved that, even in a palace, life may be led well. End of introduction. Recording by Shane Greenup. ShaneGreenup.blogspot.com and PapersAloud.com Chapter 1 of Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius by Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. Translated by George Long. Chapter 1 1. From my grandfather Verus, I learned good morals and the government of my temper. 2. From the reputation and remembrance of my father, modesty and a manly character. 3. From my mother, piety and beneficence and abstinence, not only from evil deeds, but even from evil thoughts, and further simplicity in my way of living, far removed from the habits of the rich. 4. From my great-grandfather, not to have frequented public schools, and to have had good teachers at home, and to know that on such things a man should spend liberally. 5. For my governor, to be neither of the green nor of the blue party at the games in the circus, nor a partisan either of the parmularius or the scutarius at the gladiators' fights. From him too I learned endurance of labor, and to want little, and to work with my own hands, and not to meddle with other people's affairs, and not to be ready to listen to slander. 6. From Dignatus, not to busy myself about trifling things, and not to give credit to what was said by miracle workers and jugglers about incantations and the driving away of demons and such things, and not to breed quails for fighting, nor to give myself up passionately to such things, and to endure freedom of speech, and to have become intimate with philosophy, and to have been a hearer, first of Bacchius, then of Tandasus and Marcianus, and to have written dialogues in my youth, and to have desired a plank, bed, and skin, and whatever else of the kind belongs to the Grecian discipline. From Rusticus I received the impression that my character required improvement and discipline, and from him I learned not to be led astray to sophistic emulation, nor to writing on speculative matters, 
nor to delivering little horatory orations, nor to showing myself off as a man who practices much discipline, or does benevolent acts in order to make a display, and to abstain from rhetoric, and poetry, and fine writing, and not to walk about in the house in my outdoor dress, nor to do other things of the kind, and to write my letters with simplicity, like the letter which Rusticus wrote from Sinuisa to my mother, and with respect to those who have offended me by words, or done me wrong, to be easily disposed to be pacified and reconciled, as soon as they have shown a readiness to be reconciled, and to read carefully, and not to be satisfied with a superficial understanding of a book, nor hastily to give my assent to those who talk overmuch. And I am indebted to him for being acquainted with the discourses of Epictetus, which he communicated to me out of his own collection. 8. From Apollonius I learned freedom of will and undeviating steadiness of purpose, and to look to nothing else, not even for a moment, except to reason, and to be always the same in sharp pains, on the occasion of the loss of a child, and in long illness, and to see clearly in a living example that the same man can be both most resolute and yielding, and not peevish in giving his instruction, and to have had before my eyes a man who clearly considered his experience and his skill in expounding philosophical principles as the smallest of his merits, and from him I learned how to receive from friends what are esteemed favors without being either humbled by them or letting them pass unnoticed. From Sextus, a benevolent disposition, and the example of a family governed in a fatherly manner, and the idea of living conformably to nature, and gravity without affectation, and to look carefully after the interests of friends, and to tolerate ignorant persons, and those who form opinions without consideration. He had the power of readily accommodating himself to all, so that intercourse with him was more agreeable than any flattery, and at the same time he was most highly venerated by those who associated with him, and he had the faculty both of discovering and ordering, in an intelligent and methodical way, the principles necessary for life, and he never showed anger or any other passion, but was entirely free from passion, and also most affectionate, and he could express approbation without noisy display, and he possessed much knowledge without ostentation. 10. From Alexander, the grammarian, to refrain from fault-finding, and not in a reproachful way to chide those who uttered any barbarous, or solicistic, or strange-sounding expression, but dexterously to introduce the very expression which ought to have been used, and in the way of answer or giving confirmation, or joining in an inquiry about the thing itself, not about the word, or by some other fit suggestion. 11. From Fronto the first I learned to observe what envy and duplicity and hypocrisy are in a tyrant, and that generally those among us who are called patricians are rather deficient in paternal affection. 12. From Alexander the Platonic, not frequently nor without necessity to say to any one, or to write in a letter, that I have no leisure, nor continually to excuse the neglect of duties required by our relation to those with whom we live, by alleging urgent occupations. 13. From Catullus, not to be indifferent when a friend finds fault, even if he should find fault without reason, but to try to restore him to his usual disposition, and to be ready to speak well of teachers as it is reported, of Demetius and Athanodotus, and to love my children truly. 14. From my brother Severus, to love my kin, and to love truth, and to love justice. And through him I learned to know Thrasia, Helvidius, Cato, Dion, Brutus. And from him I received the idea of a polity in which there is the same law for all, a polity administered with regard to equal rights and equal freedom of speech, and the idea of a kingly government which respects most of all the freedom of the governed. I learned from him also consistency and undeviating steadiness in my regard for philosophy, and a disposition to do good, and to give to others readily, and to cherish good hopes, and to believe that I am loved by my friends. And in him I observed no concealment of his opinions with respect to those whom he condemned, and that his friends had no need to conjecture what he wished or did not wish but it was quite plain. 15. From Maximus I learned self-government, and not to be led aside by anything, and cheerfulness in all circumstances, as well as in illness, and a just admixture in the moral character of sweetness and dignity, and to do what was set before me without complaining. I observed that everybody believed that he thought as he spoke, and that in all that he did he never had any bad intention, 
and he never showed amazement and surprise, and was never in a hurry, and never put off doing a thing, nor was perplexed, nor dejected. Nor did he ever laugh to disguise his vexation, nor, on the other hand, was he ever passionate or suspicious. He was accustomed to do acts of beneficence, and was ready to forgive, and was free from all falsehood. And he presented the appearance of a man who could not be diverted from right rather than of a man who had been improved. I observed, too, that no man could ever think that he was despised by Maximus, or ever venture to think himself a better man. He had also the art of being humorous in an agreeable way. 16. In my father I observed mildness of temper, and unchangeable resolution in the things which he had determined after due deliberation, and no vainglory in those things which men call honours, and a love of labour and perseverance, and a readiness to listen to those who had anything to propose for the common weal, an undeviating firmness in giving to every man according to his deserts, and a knowledge derived from experience of the occasions for vigorous action and for remission. And I observed that he had overcome all passion for joys, and he considered himself no more than any other citizen, and he released his friends from all obligation to sup with him or to attend him of a necessity when he went abroad, and those who failed to accompany him by reason of any urgent circumstances always found him the same. I observed, too, his habit of careful inquiry in all matters of deliberation, and his persistency and that he never stopped his investigation through being satisfied with appearances which first present themselves, and that his disposition was to keep his friends, and not to be soon tired of them, nor yet to be extravagant in his affection, and to be satisfied on all occasions, and cheerful, and to foresee things a long way off, and to provide for the smallest without display, and to check immediately popular applause and flattery and to be ever watchful over the things which were necessary for the administration of the empire, and to be a good manager of the expenditure, and patiently to endure the blame which he got for such conduct. And he was neither superstitious with respect to the gods, nor did he court men by gifts, or by trying to please them, or by flattering the populace. But he showed sobriety in all things, and firmness, and never any mean thoughts or action, nor love of novelty." and the things which conduce in any way to the commodity of life, and of which fortune gives an abundant supply, he used without arrogance and without excusing himself, so that when he had them he enjoyed them without affectation, and when he had them not he did not want them. No one could ever say of him that he was either a sophist or a home-bred flippant slave or pedant, but every one acknowledged him to be a man ripe, perfect above flattery, able to manage his own and other men's affairs. Besides this, he honoured those who were true philosophers, and he did not reproach those who pretended to be philosophers, nor yet was he easily led by them. He was also easy in conversation, and he made himself agreeable without any offence of affectation. He took a reasonable care of his body's health, not as one who was greatly attached to life, nor out of regard to personal appearance, nor yet in a careless way, but the, so that, through his own attention, he very seldom stood in need of the physician's art, or of medicine, or external applications. He was most ready to give way without envy to those who possessed any particular faculty, such as that of eloquence, or knowledge of the law, or of morals, or of anything else, and he gave them his help, that each might enjoy reputation according to his deserts. And he always acted conformably to the institutions of his country, without showing any affectation of doing so. Further, he was not fond of change, nor unsteady, but he loved to stay in the same places, and to employ himself about the same things, and after his paroxysms of headache he came immediately fresh and vigorous to his usual occupations. His secrets were not many, but very few and very rare, and these only about public matters, and he showed prudence and economy in the exhibition of the public spectacles and the construction of public buildings, his donations to the people, and in such things, for he was a man who looked to what ought to be done, not to the reputation which is got by a man's act. He did not take the bath at unseasonable hours. He was not fond of building houses, nor curious about what he eat, nor about the texture and colour of his clothes, nor about the beauty of his slaves. His dress came from Lorium, his villa on the coast, and from Lanuvium generally. We know how he behaved to the toll collector at Tusculum, who asked his pardon, and such was all his behaviour. There was in him nothing harsh, nor implacable, nor violent, 
nor, as one may say, anything carried to the sweating point. But he examined all things severally as if he had abundance of time, and without confusion, in an orderly way, vigorously and consistently. And that might be applied to him which is recorded of Socrates, that he was able both to abstain from, and to enjoy, those things which many are too weak to abstain from, and cannot enjoy without excess. But to be strong enough both to bear the one and to be sober in the other is the mark of a man who has a perfect and invincible soul, such as he showed in the illness of Maximus. 17. To the gods I am indebted for having good grandfathers, good parents, a good sister, good teachers, good associates, good kinsmen, and friends, nearly everything good. Further, I owe it to the gods that I was not hurried into any offence against any of them, though I had a disposition which, if opportunity had offered, might have led me to do something of this kind. But, through their favour, there never was such a concurrence of circumstances as put me to the trial. Further, I am thankful to the gods that I was not longer brought up with my grandfather's concubine, and that I preserved the flower of my youth, and that I did not make proof of my virility before the proper season, but even deferred the time that I was subjected to a ruler and a father who was able to take away all pride from me, and to bring me to the knowledge that it is possible for a man to live in a palace without wanting either guards, or embroidered dresses, or torches and statues, and such like show. But it is in such a man's power to bring himself very near to the fashion of a private person, without being for this reason either meaner in thought, or more remiss in action, with respect to the things which must be done for the public interest in a manner that befits a ruler. I thank the gods for giving me such a brother, who was able by his moral character to rouse me to vigilance over myself, and who, at the same time, pleased me by his respect and affection. That my children have not been stupid nor deformed in body. That I did not make more proficiency in rhetoric, poetry, and the other studies in which I should perhaps have been completely engaged, if I had seen that I was making progress in them. That I made haste to place those who brought me up in the station of honour which they seemed to desire, without putting them off with hope of my doing it some time after, because they were then still young. That I knew Apollonius, Rusticus, Maximus. That I received clear and frequent impressions about living according to nature, and what kind of a life that is, so that, so far as depended on the gods, and their gifts and help, and inspirations, nothing hindered me from forthwith living according to nature, though I still fall short of it through my own fault, and through not observing the admonitions of the gods, and, I may almost say, their direct instructions. That my body is held out so long in such a kind of life. That I never touched either Benedicta or Theodotus, and that, after having fallen into amatory passions, I was cured. And though I was often out of humour with Rusticus, I never did anything of which I had occasion to repent. That, though it was my mother's fate to die young, she spent the last years of her life with me. That, whenever I wished to help any man in his need, or on any other occasion, I was never told that I had not the means of doing it. And that to myself the same necessity never happened, to receive anything from another. That I have such a wife, so obedient and so affectionate and so simple. That I had abundance of good masters for my children. And that remedies have been shown to me by dreams, both others, and against blood-spitting and giddiness. And that, when I had an inclination to philosophy, I did not fall into the hands of any sophist and that I did not waste my time on writers of histories, or on the resolution of syllogisms, or occupy myself about the investigation of appearances in the heavens, for all these things require the help of the gods and fortune. Among the Kaidi at the Granua End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of Meditations of Marcus Aurelius》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius》by Marcus Aurelius Antoninus Translated by George Long《Chapter Two》1. Begin the morning by saying to thyself, I shall meet with the busybody, the ungrateful, arrogant, deceitful, envious, unsocial. All these things happen to them by reason of their ignorance of what is good and evil. 
but I who have seen the nature of the good that is beautiful, and of the bad that it is ugly, and the nature of him who does wrong, that it is akin to me, not only of the same blood or seed, but that it participates in the same intelligence and the same portion of the divinity. I can neither be injured by any of them, for no one can fix on me what is ugly, nor can I be angry with my kinsman, nor hate him. For we are made for cooperation, like feet, like hands, like eyelids, like the rows of the upper and lower teeth. To act against one another, then, is contrary to nature, and it is acting against one another to be vexed and to turn away. 2. Whatever this is that I am, it is a little flesh and breath, and the ruling part. Throw away thy books, no longer distract thyself, it is not allowed. But as if thou wast now dying, despise the flesh, it is blood and bones and a network, a conjecture of nerves, veins and arteries. See the breath also, what kind of a thing it is, air, and not always the same, but every moment sent out and again sucked in. The third then is the ruling part. Consider thus, thou art an old man, no longer let this be a slave, no longer be pulled by the strings like a puppet to unsocial movements, no longer be either dissatisfied with thy present lot, or shrink from the future. 3. All that is from the gods is full of providence. That which is from fortune is not separated from nature, or without an interweaving and involution with the things which are ordered by providence. From thence all things flow, and there is besides necessity, and that which is for the advantage of the whole universe, of which thou art a part. But that is good for every part of nature which the nature of the whole brings, and what serves to maintain this nature. Now the universe is preserved, as by the changes of the elements, so by the changes of things compounded of the elements. Let these principles be enough for thee, let them always be fixed opinions, but cast away the thirst after books, that thou mayest not die murmuring, but cheerfully, truly, and from thy heart thankful to the gods. 4. Remember how long thou hast been putting off these things, and how often thou hast received an opportunity from the gods, and yet dost not use it. Thou must now at last perceive of what universe thou art a part, and of what administrator of the universe thy existence is in a flux, and that a limit of time is fixed for thee, which if thou dost not use for clearing away the clouds from thy mind, it will go, and thou wilt go, and it will never return. 5. Every moment think steadily as a Roman, and a man to do what thou hast in hand with perfect and simple dignity, and feeling of affection, and freedom, and justice, and to give thyself relief from all other thoughts. And thou wilt give thyself relief if thou doest every act of thy life as if it were the last, laying aside all carelessness and passionate aversion from the commands of reason, and all hypocrisy, and self-love, and discontent with the portion which has been given to thee. Thou seest how few the things are, the which if a man lays hold of, he is able to live a life which flows in quiet and is like the existence of the gods. For the gods on their part will require nothing more from him who observes these things. 6. Do wrong to thyself, do wrong to thyself, my soul, but thou wilt no longer have the opportunity of honoring thyself. Every man's life is sufficient, but thine is nearly finished, though thy soul reverences not itself, but places thy felicity in the souls of others. 7. Do the things external which fall upon thee distract thee? Give thyself time to learn something new and good, and cease to be whirled about. But then thou must also avoid being carried about the other way, for those too are triflers who have wearied themselves in life by their activity, and yet have no object to which to direct every movement, and in a word, all their thoughts. 8. Through not observing what is in the mind of another man, has seldom been seen to be unhappy but those who do not observe the movements of their own minds must of necessity be unhappy. 9. This thou must always bear in mind, what is the nature of the whole, and what is my nature, and how this is related to that, and what kind of a part it is of what kind of a whole, and that there is no one who hinders thee from always doing and saying the things which are according to the nature of which thou art a part. 10. Theophrastus, in his comparison of bad acts, such a comparison as one would make in accordance with the common notions of mankind, says, like a true philosopher, 
that the offenses which are committed through desire are more blamable than those which are committed through anger. For he who is excited by anger seems to turn away from reason with a certain pain and unconscious contraction. But he who offends through desire, being overpowered by pleasure, seems to be in a manner more intemperate and more womanish in his offenses. Rightly then, and in a way worthy of philosophy, he said that the offence which is committed with pleasure is more blamable than that which is committed with pain. And on the whole, the one is more like a person who has been first wronged, and through pain is compelled to be angry. But the other is moved by his own impulse to do wrong, being carried toward doing something by desire. 11. Since it is possible that thou mayest depart from life this very moment, regulate every act and thought accordingly. But to go away from among men, if there are gods, is not a thing to be afraid of, for the gods will not involve thee in evil. But if indeed they do not exist, or if they have no concern about human affairs, what is it to me to live in a universe devoid of gods or devoid of providence? But in truth they do exist, and they do not care for human things, and they have put all the means in man's power to enable him not to fall into real evils. And as to the rest, if there was anything evil, they would have provided for this also, that it should be altogether in a man's power not to fall into it. Now, that which does not make a man worse, how can it make a man's life worse? But neither through ignorance, nor having the knowledge, but not the power to guard against or correct these things, it is possible that the nature of the universe has overlooked them. Nor is it possible that it has made so great a mistake, either through want of power or want of skill, that good and evil should happen indiscriminately to the good and the bad. But death certainly, and life, honor and dishonor, pain and pleasure, all these things equally happen to good men and bad, being things which make us neither better nor worse, therefore they are neither good nor evil. 12. How quickly all these things disappear! In the universe the bodies themselves, but in time the remembrance of them. What is the nature of all sensible things? and particularly those which attract with the bait of pleasure, or terrify by pain, or are noised about by vapory fame. How worthless and contemptible, and sordid, and perishable, and dead they are! All this it is the part of the intellectual faculty to observe. To observe, too, who these are whose opinions and voices give reputation. What death is, and the fact that, if a man looks at it in himself, and by the abstractive power of reflection resolves into their parts all the things which present themselves to the imagination in it, he will then consider it to be nothing else than an operation of nature. And if any one is afraid of an operation of nature, he is a child. This, however, is not only an operation of nature, but it is also a thing which conduces to the purposes of nature. To observe, too, how man comes near to the deity, and by what part of him, and when this part of man, is so disposed. 13. Nothing is more wretched than a man who traverses everything in a round, and pries into things beneath the earth, as the poet says, and seeks by conjecture what is in the minds of his neighbors, without perceiving that it is sufficient to attend to the demon within him, and to reverence it sincerely. And reverence of the demon consists in keeping it pure from passion and thoughtlessness, and dissatisfaction with what comes from gods and men. For the things from gods merit veneration for their excellence, and the things from men should be dear to us by reason of kinship, and sometimes even, in a manner, they move our pity by reason of men's ignorance of good and bad, this defect being not less than that which deprives us of the power of distinguishing things that are white and black. 14. Though thou shouldest be going to live three thousand years, and as many times ten thousand years, Still remember that no man loses any other life than this which he now lives, nor lives any other than this which he now loses. The longest and shortest are thus brought to the same, for the present is the same to all, though that which perishes is not the same, and so that which is lost appears to be a mere moment. For a man cannot lose either the past or the future, for what a man has not, how can any one take this from him? These two things then thou must bear in mind, the one that all things from eternity are of like forms, and come round in a circle, and that it makes no difference whether a man shall see the same things during a hundred years, or two hundred, or an infinite time. And the second, 
that the longest liver and he who will die soonest lose just the same. For the present is the only thing of which a man can be deprived. If it is true that this is the only thing which he has, and that a man cannot lose a thing if he has it not. 15. Remember that all is opinion. For what was said by the cynic Monimus is manifest. And manifest, too, is the use of what was said, if a man receives what may be got out of it as far as it is true. 16. The soul of man does violence to itself, first of all when it becomes as abscess, and, as it were, a tumor on the universe, so far as it can. For to be vexed at anything which happens is a separation of ourselves from nature, in some part of which the natures of all other things are contained. In the next place, the soul does violence to itself when it turns away from any man, or even moves towards him with the intention of injuring, such as are the souls of those who are angry. In the third place, the soul does violence to itself when it is overpowered by pleasure or by pain. Fourthly, when it plays a part and does or says anything insincerely and untruly. Fifthly, when it allows any act of its own and any movement to be without an aim, and does anything thoughtlessly and without considering what it is, being right that even the smallest things be done with reference to an end. And the end of rational animals is to follow the reason and the law of the most ancient city and polity. 17. Of human life the time is a point, and the substance is in a flux, and the perception dull, and the composition of the whole body subject to putrefaction, and the soul of a whirl, and fortune hard to divine, and fame a thing devoid of judgment. And to say all in a word, everything which belongs to the body is a stream, and what belongs to the soul is a dream and vapor, and life is a warfare and a stranger's sojourn, and after fame is oblivion. What then is that which is able to conduct a man? One thing, and only one, philosophy. But this consists in keeping the demon within a man free from violence and unharmed, superior to pains and pleasures, doing nothing without a purpose, nor yet falsely and with hypocrisy, not feeling the need of another man's doing or not doing anything. And besides, accepting all that happens, and all that is allotted, as coming from thence, wherever it is, from whence he himself came. And finally, waiting for death with a cheerful mind, as being nothing else than a dissolution of the elements of which every living being is compounded. But if there is no harm to the elements themselves in each continually changing into another, why should a man have any apprehension about the change and dissolution of all the elements? For it is according to nature, and nothing is evil which is according to nature. This Incarnuntum End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shane Greenup – The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius by Marcus Aurelius Antoninus Translated by George Long – Chapter Three We ought to consider not only that our life is daily wasting away, and a smaller part of it is left. But another thing also must be taken into the account, that if a man should live longer, it is quite, un quite uncertain whether the understanding will still continue sufficient for the comprehension of things, and retain the power of contemplation which strives to acquire the knowledge of the divine and the human. For if he shall begin to fall into dotage, perspiration and nutrition, and imagination and appetite, and whatever else there is of the kind will not fail. But the power of making use of ourselves and filling up the measure of our duty, and clearly separating all appearances, and considering whether a man should now depart from life, and whatever else of the kind absolutely requires a disciplined reason, all this is already extinguished. We must make haste then, not only because we are daily nearer to death, but also because the conception of things and the understanding of them cease first. 2. We ought to observe also that even the things which follow after the things which are produced according to nature contain something pleasing and attractive. For instance, when bread is baked some parts are split at the surface, and these parts which thus open and have a certain fashion contrary to the purpose of the baker's art are beautiful in a manner, 
and in a peculiar way excite a desire for eating. And again figs, when they are quite ripe, gape open, and in the ripe olives the very circumstance of their being near to rottenness adds a peculiar beauty to the fruit. And the ears of corn bending down, and the lion's eyebrows, and the foam which flows from the mouth of wild boars, and many other things, though they are far from being beautiful, if a man should examine them severally, still, because they are cons consequent upon the things which are formed by nature, help to adorn them, and they please the mind, so that if a man should have a feeling and a deeper insight with respect to the things which are produced in the universe, there is hardly one of those which follow by way of consequence which will not seem to him to be in a manner disposed so as to give pleasure. And so he will see even the real gaping jaws of wild beasts with no less pleasure than those which painters and sculptors show by imitation, and in an old woman and an old man he will be able to see a certain maturity and comeliness, and the attractive loveliness of young persons he will be able to look on with chaste eyes, and many such things will present themselves, not pleasing to every man, but to him only who has become truly familiar with nature and her works. 3. Hippocrates, after curing many diseases, himself fell sick and died. The Chaldai foretold the deaths of many, and then fate caught them too. Alexander and Pompeius and Caius Caesar, after so often completely destroying whole cities, and in battle cutting to pieces many tens of thousands of cavalry and infantry, themselves too at last departed from life. Heraclitus, after so many speculations on the conflagration of the universe, was filled with water internally, and died smeared all over with mud. And lice destroyed Democritus, and other lice killed Socrates. What means all this? Thou hast embarked, thou hast made the voyage, thou art come to shore, get out. If indeed to another life there is no want of gods, not even there, but it to state without sensation, thou wilt cease to be held by pains and pleasures, and to be a slave to the vessel which is as much inferior as that which serves it is superior. For the one is intelligence and deity, the other is earth and corruption. 4. Do not waste the remainder of thy life in thoughts about others. When thou dost not refer thy thoughts to some object of common utility, for thou losest the opportunity of doing something else when thou hast such thoughts as these. What is such a person doing, and why, and what is he saying, and what is he thinking of, and what is he contriving, and whatever else of the kind makes us wander away from the observation of our own ruling power. We ought then to check in the series of our thoughts everything that is without a purpose and useless, but most of all the over-curious feeling and the malignant, and a man should use himself to think of those things only about which, if one should suddenly ask, What hast thou now in thy thoughts? With perfect openness thou mightest immediately answer, This or that, so that from thy words it should be plain that everything in thee is simple and benevolent, and such as befits a social animal, one that cares not for thoughts about pleasure or sensual enjoyments at all, nor has any rivalry or envy and suspicion, or anything else for which thou wouldst blush if thou shouldst say, that thou hadst it in thy mind. For the man who is such, and no longer delays being among the number of the best, is like a priest and minister of the gods, using too the deity which is planted within him, which makes the man uncontaminated by pleasure, unharmed by any pain, untouched by any insult, feeling no wrong, a fighter in the noblest fight, one who cannot be overpowered by any passion, died deep with justice, accepting with all his soul everything which happens and is assigned to him as his position, and not even, nor yet without great necessity and for the general interest, imagining what another says or does or thinks. For it is only what belongs to himself that he makes the matter for his activity, and he constantly thinks of that which is allotted to himself out of the sum total of things, and he makes his own act fair, and he is persuaded that his own portion is good. For the lot which is assigned to each man is carried along with him, and carries him along with it. And he remembers also that every rational animal is his kinsman, and that to care for all men 
is according to man's nature, and the man should hold on to the opinion not of all, but of those only who confessedly live according to nature. But as to those who live not so, he always bears in mind what kind of men they are both at home and from home, both by night and by day, and what they are, and with what men they live an impure life. Accordingly, he does not value at all the praise which comes from such men, since they are not even satisfied with themselves. 5. Labor not unwillingly, nor without regard to common interest, nor without due consideration, nor with distraction, nor let studied ornaments set off thy thoughts, and be not either a man of many words, or busy about too many things. And further, let the deity which is in thee be the guardian of a living being, manly and of ripe age, and engaged in matter political, and a Roman and a ruler who has taken his post like a man waiting for the signal which summons him from life, and ready to go, having need neither of oath nor of any man's testimony. Be cheerful also, and seek not external help, nor the tranquillity which others give. A man must stand erect, not be kept erect by others. 6. If thou findest in human life anything better than justice, truth, temperance, temperance, fortitude, and in a word anything better than thy own mind's self-satisfaction in the things which it enables thee to do according to right reason and in the condition that is assigned to thee without thy own choice. If, I say, thou seest anything better than this, turn to it with all thy soul, and enjoy that which thou hast found to be the best. But if nothing appears to be better than the deity which is planted in thee, which has subjected to itself all thy appetites, and carefully examines all the impressions, and as Socrates said, has detached itself from the persuasions of sense, and has submitted itself to the gods, and cares for mankind, if thou findest everything else smaller and of less value than this, give place to nothing else. For if thou dost once diverge and incline to it, thou wilt no longer without distraction be able to give the preference to that good thing which is thy proper possession and thy own. For it is not right that anything of any, ki any other kind, such as praise from the many, or power, or enjoyment of pleasure, should come into competition with that which is rationally and politically or practically good. All these things, even though they may seem to adapt themselves to the better things, in a small degree, obtain the superiority all at once and carry us away. But do thou, I say, simply and freely choose the better and hold to it. But that which is useful is better. Well then, if it is only useful to thee as a rational being, keep to it. But if it is only useful to thee as an animal, say so, and maintain thy judgment without arrogance. Only take care that thou makest the inquiry as by a sure method. 7. Never value anything as profitable to thyself which shall compel thee to break thy promise. To lose thy self-respect, to hate any man, to suspect, to curse, to act the hypocrite, to desire anything which needs walls and curtains. For he who has preferred to everything else his own intelligence, and the demon and the worship of its excellence, acts no tragic part, does not groan, will not need either solitude or much company. And what is chief of all, he will live without either pursuing or flying from death. But whether for a longer or a shorter time he shall have the soul enclosed in the body, he cares not at all. For even if he must depart immediately, he will go as readily as if he were going to do anything else which can be done with decency and order, taking care of this only all through life, that his thoughts turn not away from anything which belongs to an intelligent animal and a member of a civil community. 8. In the mind of one who is chastened and purified, thou wilt find no corrupt matter, no impurity, nor any sore skinned over, nor is his life incomplete when fate overtakes him, as one may say of an actor who leaves the stage before ending and finishing the play. Besides, there is in him nothing servile, nor affected, nor too closely bound to other things, nor yet detached from other things. Nothing worthy of blame, nothing which seeks a hiding place. 9. Reverence the faculty which produces opinion. 
On this faculty it entirely depends whether there shall exist in thy ruling part any opinion inconsistent with nature and the constitution of the rational animal. And this faculty promises freedom from hasty judgment, and friendship towards men, and obedience to the gods. 10. Throwing away then all things, hold to these only which are few, and besides bear in mind that every man lives only his present time, which is an indivisible point, and that all the rest of his life is either past or it is uncertain. Short then is the time which every man lives, and small the nook of the earth where he lives, and short too the longest posthumous fame, and even this only continued by a succession of poor human beings who will very soon die, and who no, know not even themselves, much less him who died long ago. 11. To the aids which have been mentioned, let this one still be added. Make for thyself a definition or description of the thing which is presented to thee, so as to see distinctly what kind of a thing it is in its substance, in its nudity, in its complete entirety, and tell thyself its proper name, and the names of the things of which it has been compounded, and into which it will, will be resolved. For nothing is so productive of elevation of mind as to be able to examine methodically and truly every object which is presented to thee in life, and always to look at things so as to see at the same time what kind of universe this is, and what kind of use everything performs in it, and what value everything has with reference to the whole, and what with reference to man, who is a citizen of the highest city, of which all other cities are like families, what each thing is, and of what it is composed, and how long it is the nature of this thing to endure which now makes an impression on me, and what virtue I have need of with respect to it, such as gentleness, manliness, truth, fidelity, simplicity, contentment, and the rest. Wherefore, on every occasion a man should say, this comes from God, and this is according to the appointment and spinning of the thread of destiny, and such like coincidence and chance, and this is from one of the same stock, and a kinsman and partner, one who knows not, however, what is according to his nature. But I know, for this reason, I behave towards him according to the natural law of fellowship with benevolence and justice. At the same time, however, in things indifferent, I attempt to ascertain the value of each. 12. If thou workest at that which is before thee, following right reason seriously, vigorously, calmly, without allowing anything else to distract thee, but keeping thy divine part pure, as if thou shouldst be bound to give it back immediately, if thou holdest to this, expecting nothing, fearing nothing, but satisfied with thy present activity according to nature, and with heroic truth in every word and sound which thou utterest, thou wilt live happy and there is no man who is able to prevent this. 13. As physicians have always their instruments and knives ready for cases which suddenly require their skill, so do thou have principles ready for the understanding of things divine and human, and doing everything, even the smallest, with a recollection of the bond which unites the divine and human to one another. For neither wilt thou do anything well which pertains to man without at the same time having a reference to things divine, nor the contrary. 14. No longer wander at hazard, for neither wilt thou read thy own memoirs, nor the acts of the ancient Romans and the Hellens, and the selections from books which thou wast reserving for thy old age. Hasten then to the end which thou hast before thee, and throwing away idle hopes, come to thy own aid, if thou carest at all for thyself, while it is in thy power. 15. They know not how many things are signified by the words stealing, sowing, buying, keeping quiet, seeing what ought to be done, for this is not affected by the eyes, but by another kind of vision. 16. Body, soul, intelligence. To the body belong sensations, to the soul, appetites, to the intelligence, principles. To receive the impressions of forms by means of appearances belongs even to animals. To be pulled by the strings of desires belongs both to wild beasts and to men, who have made themselves into women. And to a Phalaris and a Nero, and to have the intelligence that guides to the things which appear suitable belongs also to those who do not believe in the gods, and who betray their country, and do their impure deeds when they have shut the doors. 
If then everything else is common to all that I have mentioned, there remains that which is peculiar to the good man, to be pleased and content with what happens and with the thread which is spun for him, and not to defile the divinity which is planted in his breast, nor disturb it by a crowd of images, but to preserve it tranquil, following it obediently as a god, neither saying anything contrary to the truth, nor doing anything contrary to justice. And if all men refuse to believe that he lives a simple, modest, and contented life, he is neither angry with any of them, nor does he deviate from the way which leads to the end of life, to which a man ought to come pure, tranquil, ready to depart, and without any compulsion perfectly reconciled to his lot. End of chapter 3 Recording by Shane Greenup www.papersaloud.com Chapter 4 of Meditations of Marcus Aurelius This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius by Marcus Aurelius Antoninus Translated by George Long Chapter 4 That which rules within, when it is according to nature, is so affected with respect to the events which happen, that it always easily adapts itself to that which is possible, and is presented to it. For it requires no definite material, but it moves towards its purpose, under certain conditions, however, and it makes a material for itself out of that which opposes it, as fire lays hold of what falls into it, but which a small light would have been extinguished. But when the fire is strong, it soon appropriates to itself the matter which is heaped on it, and consumes it, and rises higher by means of this very material. Let no act be done without a purpose, nor otherwise than according to the perfect principles of art. Men seek retreats for themselves, houses in the country, seashores, and the mountains, and thou too art wont to desire such things very much. But this is altogether a mark of the most common sort of men, for it is in thy power whenever thou shalt choose to retire into thyself, for nowhere, either with more quiet or more freedom from trouble, does a man retire than into his own soul, particularly when he has within him such thoughts that by looking into them he is immediately in perfect tranquillity. And I affirm that tranquillity is nothing else than the good ordering of the mind. Constantly, then, give to thyself this retreat, and renew thyself, and let thy principles be brief and fundamental, which, as soon as thou shalt recur to them, will be sufficient to cleanse the soul completely, and to send thee back free from all discontent with the things to which thou returnest. For with what art thou discontented? With the badness of men? Recall to thy mind this conclusion, that rational animals exist for one another, and that to endure is a part of justice, and that men do wrong involuntarily. And consider how many already, after mutual enmity, suspicion, hatred, and fighting, have been stretched dead, reduced to ashes, and be quiet at last. But perhaps thou art dissatisfied with that which is assigned to thee out of the universe. Recall to thy recollection this alternative. Either there is providence or atoms, fortuitous concurrence of things. Or remember the arguments by which it has been proved that the world is a kind of political community, and be quiet at last. But perhaps corporeal things will, fa will still fasten upon thee. Consider then further that the mind mingles not with the breath, whether moving gently or violently, when it has once drawn itself apart and discovered its own power. And think also of all that thou hast heard and assented to about pain and pleasure, and be quiet at last. But perhaps the desire of the thing called fame will torment thee. See how soon everything is forgotten, and look at the chaos of infinite time on each side of the present, and the emptiness of applause, and the changeableness and want of judgment in those who pretend to give praise, and the narrowness of the space within which it is circumscribed, and be quiet at last. 
for the whole earth is a point and how small a nook in it is this thy dwelling place and how few are there in it and what kind of people are they who will praise thee this then remains remember to retire into this little territory of thy own and above all do not distract or strain thyself but be free at look and things as a man as a human being as a citizen as a mortal but among the things readiest to thy hand to which thou shalt return let there be these which are two one is that things do not touch the soul for they are external and remain immovable but our perturbations come only from the opinion which is within the other is that all these things which thou seest change immediately and will no longer be and constantly bear in mind how many of these changes thou hast already witnessed the universe is transformation life is opinion if our intellectual part is common the reason also in respect of which we are rational beings is common if this is so common also is the reason which commands us what to do and what not to do if this is so there is a common law also if this is so we are fellow citizens if this is so we are members of some political community if this is so the world is in a manner a state for of what other common political community will anyone say that the whole human race are members and from thence from this common political community comes also our very intellectual faculty and reasoning faculty and their capacity for law or whence do they come for as my earthly part is a portion given to me from certain earth and that which is watery from another element and that which is hot and fiery from some peculiar source for nothing comes out of that which is nothing as nothing also returns to non-existence so also the intellectual part comes from some source death is such as generation is a mystery of nature a composition out of the same elements and a decomposition into the same and altogether not a thing of which any man should be ashamed for it is not contrary to the nature of a reasonable animal and not contrary to the reason of our constitution it is natural that these things should be done by such persons it is a matter of necessity and if a man will not have it so he will not allow the fig tree to have juice but by all means bear this in mind that within a very short time both thou and he will be dead and soon not even your names will be left behind take away thy opinion and then there is taken away the complaint i have been harmed take away the complaint i have been harmed and the harm is taken away that which does not make a man worse than he was also does not make his life worse nor does it harm him either from without or from within the nature of that which is universally useful has been compelled to do this consider that everything which happens happens justly and if thou observest carefully thou wilt find it to be so i do not say only with respect to the continuity of the series of things but with respect to what is just and as if it were done by one who assigns to each thing its value observe then that thou hast begun and whatever thou doest do it in conjunction with this the being good and in the sense in which a man is properly understood to be good keep to this in every action do not have such an opinion of things as he has who does thee wrong or such as he wishes thee to have but look at them as they are in truth a man should always have these two rules in readiness the one to do only whatever the reason of the ruling and legislating faculty may suggest for the use of men the other to change thy opinion if there is any one at hand who sets thee right and moves thee from any opinion but this change of opinion must proceed only from a certain persuasion as of what is just or of common advantage and the like not because it appears pleasant or brings reputation hast thou reason i have why then dost not thou use it 
For if this does its own work, what else dost thou wish? Thou hast existed as a part. Thou shalt disappear in that which produced thee, but rather thou shalt be received back into its seminal principle by transmutation. Many grains of frankincense on the same altar. One falls before, another falls after, but it makes no difference. Within ten days thou wilt seem a god to those to whom thou art now a beast and an ape if thou wilt return to thy principles and to worship of reason. Do not act as if thou wert going to live ten thousand years. Death hangs over thee. While thou livest, while it is in thy power, be good. How much trouble he avoids who does not look to see what his neighbor says or does or thinks, but only to what he does himself, that it may be just and pure. Or, as Agathon says, look not round at the depraved morals of others, but run straight along the line without deviating from it. He who has a vehement desire for posthumous fame does not consider that every one of those who remember him will himself also die very soon. Then again also they who have succeeded them, until the whole remembrance shall have been extinguished as it is transmitted through men who foolishly admire and perish. Suppose that those who will remember are even immortal, and that the remembrance will be immortal. What then is this to thee? And I say not, what is it to the dead, but what is it to the living? What is praise, except indeed so far as it has a certain utility? For thou now reject, rejectest unseasonably the gift of nature, clinging to something else. Everything which is in it any way beautiful is beautiful in itself and terminates in itself, not having praise as a part of itself. Neither worse then nor better is a thing made by being praised. I affirm this also of the things which are called beautiful by the vulgar, for example, material things and works of art. That which is really beautiful has no need of anything, not more than law, not more than truth, not more than benevolence or modesty. Which of these things is beautiful because it is praised? or spoiled by being blamed. Is such a thing as an emerald made worse than it was, if it is not praised? Or gold, ivory, purple, a lyre, a little knife, a flower, a shrub? If souls continue to exist, how does the air contain them from eternity? But how does the earth contain the bodies of those who have been buried from times so remote? For as here the mutation of these bodies, after a certain continuance, whatever it may be, and their dissolution make room for other dead bodies. So the souls which are removed into the air after subsisting for some time are transmuted and diffused, and assume a fiery nature by being received into the seminal intelligence of the universe, and in this way make room for the fresh souls which come to dwell there. And this is the answer which a man might give on the hypothesis of souls continuing to exist. But we must not only think of the number of bodies which are thus buried, but also of the number of animals which are daily eaten by us and the other animals. For what a number is consumed, and thus in a manner buried in the bodies of those who feed on them, and nevertheless this earth receives them by reason of the changes of these bodies into blood, and the transformations into the aerial or the fiery element. What is the investigation into the truth of the matter? The division into that which is material and that which is the cause of form, the formal. Do not be whirled about, but in every movement have respect to justice, and on the occasion of every impression maintain the faculty of comprehension or understanding. Everything harmonizes with me which is harmonious to thee, O universe. Nothing for me is too early nor too late, which is in due time for thee. Everything is fruit to me which thy seasons bring, O nature. From thee are all things, in thee are all things, to thee all things return. The poet says, Dear city of sea crops, and wilt not thou say, Dear city of Zeus? Occupy thyself with few things, says the philosopher, if thou wouldst be tranquil. But consider if it would not be better to say, Do what is necessary, 
and whatever the reason of the animal which is naturally social requires, and as it requires. For this brings not only the tranquility which comes from doing well, but also that which comes from doing few things. For the greatest part of what we say and do being unnecessary, if a man takes this away, he will have more leisure and less uneasiness. Accordingly, on every occasion a man should ask himself, Is this one of the unnecessary things? Now a man should take away not only unnecessary acts, but also unnecessary thoughts, for thus superfluous acts will not follow after. Try how the life of a good man suits thee, the life of him who is satisfied with his portion out of the whole, and satisfied with his own just acts and benevolent disposition. Hast thou seen those things? Look also at these. Do not disturb thyself. Make thyself all simplicity. Does any one do wrong? It is to himself that he does wrong. Has anything happened to thee? Well, out of the universe from the beginning everything which happens has been apportioned and spun out to thee. In a word, thy life is short. Thou must turn to profit the present by the aid of reason and justice. Be sober in thy relaxation. Either it is a well-arranged universe or a chaos huddled together, but still a universe. But can a certain order subsist in thee and disorder in all? And this, too, when all things are so separated and diffused and sympathetic. A black character, a womanish character, a stubborn character, bestial, childish, animal, stupid, counterfeit, scurrilous, fraudulent, tyrannical. If he is a stranger to the universe who does not know what is in it, no less is he a stranger who does not know what is going on in it. He is a runaway, who flies from social reason. He is blind, who shuts the eyes of the understanding. He is poor, who has need of another, and has not from himself all things which are useful for life. He is an abscess on the universe, who withdraws and separates himself from the reason of our common nature, through being displeased with the things which happen. For the same nature produces this, and has produced thee too. He is a piece rent asunder from the state, who tears his own soul from that of reasonable animals, which is one. The one is a philosopher without a tunic, and the other without a book. Here is another half-naked. Bread I have not, he says, and I abide by reason, and I do not get the means of living out of my learning, and I abide by my reason. Love the art, poor as it may be, which thou hast learned, and be content with it, and pass through the rest of life like one who has entrusted to the gods with his whole soul all that he has, making himself neither the tyrant nor the slave of any man. Consider, for example, the times of Vespasian. Thou wilt see all these things, people marrying, bringing up children, sick, dying, warring, feasting, trafficking, cultivating the ground, flattering, obstinately arrogant, suspecting, plotting, wishing for some to die, grumbling about the present, loving, heaping up treasure, desiring consulship, kingly power. Well, then, that life of these people no longer exists at all. Again, remove to the time of Trajan. Again, all is the same. Their life, too, is gone. In like manner, view also the other epics of time and of whole nations, and see how many, after great efforts, soon fell and were resolved into the elements. But chiefly thou shouldst think of those whom thou hast thyself known distracting themselves about idle things, neglecting to do what was in accordance with their proper constitution and to hold firmly to this, and to be content with it. And herein it is necessary to remember that the attention given to everything has its proper value and proportion. For thus thou wilt not be dissatisfied if thou appliest thyself to smaller matters no further than is fit. The words which were formerly familiar are now antiquated. So also the names of those who were famed of old are now in a manner antiquated. Camillus, Caso, Valesus, Leonidas, and a little after also Scipio and Cato, then Augustus, then also Hadrianus and Antoninus. 
for all things soon pass away and become a mere tale, and complete oblivion soon buries them. And I say this of those who have shown a, in a wondrous way. For the rest, as soon as they have breathed out their breath, they are gone, and no man speaks of them. And to conclude the matter, what is even an eternal remembrance, a mere nothing? What, then, is that about which we ought to employ our serious pains? This one thing, thoughts just, and acts social, and words which never lie, and a disposition which gladly accepts all that happens as necessary, as usual, as flowing from a principle and a source of the same kind. Willingly give thyself up to Clotho, one of the fates, allowing her to spin thy thread into whatever things she pleases. Everything is only for a day, both that which remembers and that which is remembered. Observe constantly that all things take place by change, and accustom thyself to consider that the nature of the universe loves nothing so much as to change the things which are, and to make new things like them. For everything that exists is in a manner the seed of that which will be, but thou art thinking only of seeds which are cast into the earth or into a womb. But this is a very vulgar notion. Thou wilt soon die, and thou art not yet simple, not free from perturbations, not without suspicion of being hurt by external things, nor kindly disposed toward all, nor dost thou yet place wisdom only in acting justly. Examine men's ruling principles, even those of the wise, what kind of things they avoid, and what kind they pursue. What is evil to thee does not subsist in the ruling principle of another, nor yet in any turning and mutation of thy corporeal covering. Where is it, then? It is in that part of thee in which subsists the power of forming opinions about evils. Let this power then not form such opinions, and all is well. And if that which is nearest to it, the poor body, is cut, burnt, filled with matter and rottenness, Nevertheless, let the part which forms opinions about these things be quiet. That is, let it judge that nothing is either bad or good which can happen equally to the bad man and the good. For that which happens equally to him who lives contrary to nature, and to him who lives according to nature, is neither according to nature nor contrary to nature. Constantly regard the universe as one living being, having one substance and one soul and observe how all things have reference to one perception, the perception of this one living being, and how all things act with one movement, and how all things are the cooperative causes of all things which exist. Observe, too, the continuous spinning of the thread and the contexture of the web. Thou art a little soul bearing about a corpse, as Epictetus used to say. It is no evil for things to undergo change, and no good for things to subsist in consequence of change. Time is like a river made up of the events which happen, and a violent stream, for as soon as a thing has been seen, it is carried away, and another comes in its place, and this will be carried away too. Everything which happens is as familiar and well known as the rose in spring and the fruit in summer, for such is disease and death and calumny and te treachery and whatever else delights fools or vexes them. In the series of things, those which follow are always aptly fitted to those which have gone before. For this series is not like a mere enumeration of disjointed things, which only has a necessary sequence, but it is a rational connection. And as all existing things are arranged together harmoniously, so the things which come into existence exhibit no mere succession, but a certain wonderful relationship. Always remember the saying of Heraclitus, that the death of earth is to become water, and the death of water is to become air, and the death of air is to become fire, and reversely. And think too of him who forgets whither the way leads, and that men quarrel with that with which they are most constantly in communion, the reason which governs the universe. And the things which they daily meet with seem to them strange, 
and consider that we ought not to act and speak as if we were asleep, for even in sleep we seem to act and speak, and that we ought not, like children who learn from their parents, simply to act and speak as we have been taught. If any god told thee that thou shalt die tomorrow, or certainly on the day after tomorrow, thou wouldst not care much whether it was on the third day or on the morrow, unless thou wast in the highest degree mean-spirited, for how small is the difference? So think, it is no great thing to die after as many years as thou canst name, rather than tomorrow. Think continually how many physicians are dead after often contracting their eyebrows over the sick, and how many astrologers after predicting with great pretensions the deaths of others, and how many philosophers after endless discourses on death or immortality, how many heroes after killing thousands, and how many tyrants who have used their power over men's lives with terrible insolence as if they were immortal, and how many cities are entirely dead, so to speak, Helis and Pompeii and Herculaneum, and others innumerable. Add to the reckoning all whom thou hast known, one after another. One man, after burying another, has been laid out dead, and another buries him, and all this in a short time. To conclude, always observe how ephemeral and worthless human things are, and what was yesterday a little mucus, tomorrow will be a mummy or ashes. Pass then through this little space of time, conformably to nature, and end thy journey in content, just as an olive falls off when it is ripe, blessing nature who produced it, and thanking the tree on which it grew. Be like the promontory against which the waves continually break, but it stands firm and tames the fury of the water around it. Unhappy am I because this has happened to me. Not so, but happy am I, though this has happened to me, because I continue free from pain, neither crushed by the present nor fearing the future. For such a thing as this might have happened to every man, but every man would not have continued free from pain on such an occasion. Why then? Is that rather a misfortune than this a good fortune? And dost thou in all cases call that a man's misfortune, which is not a deviation from man's nature? And does a thing seem to thee to be a deviation from man's nature, when it is not contrary to the will of man's nature? Well, thou knowest the will of nature. Will then this which has happened prevent thee from being just, magnanimous, temperate, prudent, secure against inconsiderate opinions and falsehoods? Will it prevent thee from having modesty, freedom, and everything else, by the presence of which man's nature obtains all that is its own? Remember, too, in every occasion which leads thee to vexation to apply this principle, not that this is a misfortune, but that to bear it nobly is good fortune. It is a vulgar but still a useful help towards contempt of death to pass in review those who have tenaciously stuck to life. What more than have they gained than those who have died early? Certainly they lie in their tombs somewhere at last. Cadicianus, Fabius, Julianus, Lepidus, or anyone else like them, who have carried out many to be buried, and then were carried out themselves. Altogether the interval is small between birth and death. And consider with how much trouble, and in company with what sort of people, and in what a feeble body this interval is laboriously passed. Do not then consider life a thing of any value. For look to the immensity of time behind thee, and to the time which is before thee, another boundless space. In this in infinity, then, what is the difference between him who lives three days and him who lives three generations? Always run the short way. And the short way is the natural. Accordingly say and do everything in conformity with the soundest reason. For such a purpose frees a man from trouble, and warfare, and all artifice, and ostentatious display. End of chapter 4。Chapter 5 of Meditations of Marcus Aurelius.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius by Marcus Aurelius Antoninus Translated by George Long Chapter 5 In the morning, when thou risest unwillingly, let this thought be present. I am rising to the work of a human being. Why, then, am I dissatisfied if I am going to do the things for which I exist and for which I was brought into the world? Or have I been made for this, to lie in the bedclothes and keep myself warm? But this is more pleasant. Dost thou exist, then, to take thy pleasure? and not at all for action or exertion? Dost thou not see the little plants, the little birds, the ants, the spiders, the bees, working together to put in order their several parts of the universe? And art thou unwilling to do the work of a human being? And dost thou not make haste to do that which is according to thy nature? But it is necessary to take rest also. It is necessary. However, nature has fixed bounds to this too. She has fixed bounds both to eating and drinking, and yet thou goest beyond these bounds, beyond what is sufficient. Yet in thy acts it is not so, but thou stoppest short of what thou canst do. So thou lovest not thyself, for if thou didst, thou wouldst love thy nature and her will. But those who love their several arts exhaust themselves in working at them unwashed and without food. But thou valuest thy own nature less than the turner values the turning art, or the dancer the dancing art, or the lover of money values his money, or the vainglorious man his little glory. And such men, when they have a violent affection to a thing, choose neither to eat nor to sleep rather than to perfect the things which they care for. But are the acts which concern society more vile in thy eyes and less worthy of thy labor? How easy it is to repel and to wipe away every impression which is troublesome or unsuitable and immediately to be in all tranquility. Judge every word and deed which are according to nature to be fit for thee, and be not diverted by the blame which follows from any people, nor by their words. But if a thing is good to be done or said, do not consider it unworthy of thee. For those persons have their peculiar leading principle, and follow their peculiar movement, which things do not thou regard, but go straight on, following thy own nature and the common nature, and the way of both is one. I go through the things which happen according to nature, and I shall fall and rest, breathing out my breath into that element out of which I daily draw it in, and falling upon that earth out of which my father collected the seed, and my mother the blood, and my nurse the milk, out of which during so many years I have been supplied with food and drink, which bears me when I tread on it and abuse it for so many purposes. Thou sayest, men cannot admire the sharpness of thy wits. Be it so, but there are many other things of which thou canst not say, I am not formed for them by nature. Show those qualities, then, which are altogether in thy power, sincerity, gravity, endurance of labor, aversion to pleasure, contentment with thy portion and with few things, benevolence, frankness, no love of superfluity, freedom from trifling magnanimity. Dost thou not see how many qualities thou art immediately able to exhibit? in which there is no excuse of natural incapacity and unfitness, and yet thou still remainest voluntarily below the mark? 
or art thou compelled through being defectively furnished by nature to murmur and to be stingy and to flatter and to find fault with the, thy poor body and to try to please men and to make great display and to be restless in thy mind no by the gods but thou mightest have been delivered from these things long ago only if in truth thou canst be charged with being rather slow and dull of comprehension thou must exert thyself about this also not neglecting it nor yet taking pleasure in thy dullness one man when he has done a service to another is ready to set it down to his account as a favor conferred another is not ready to do this but still in his own mind he thinks of the man as his debtor and he knows what he has done a third in a manner does not even know what he has done but he is like a vine which has produced grapes and seeks for nothing more after it has once produced its proper fruit as a horse when he has run a dog when he has tracked the game a bee when it has made the honey so a man when he has done a good act does not call out for others to come and see but he goes on to another act as a vine goes on to produce again the grapes in season must a man then be one of these who in a manner act thus without observing it yes but this very thing is necessary the observation of what a man is doing for it may be said it is characteristic of the social animal to perceive that he is working in a social manner and indeed to wish that his social partner also should perceive it it is true what thou sayest but thou dost not rightly understand what is now said and for this reason thou wilt become one of those of whom i spoke before for even they are misled by a certain show of reason but if thou wilt choose to understand the meaning of what is said do not fear that for this reason thou wilt omit any social act a prayer of the athenians rain rain o dear zeus down on the ploughed fields of the athenians and on the plains in truth we ought not to pray at all or we ought to pray in this simple and noble fashion just as we must understand when it is said that Aesculapius prescribed to this man horse exercise, or bathing in cold water, or going without shoes, so we must understand it when it is said that the nature of the universe prescribed to this man disease or mutilation or loss or anything else of the kind. For in the first case, prescribed means something like this. He prescribed this for this man as a thing adapted to procure health and in the second case it means that which happens to or suits every man is fixed in a manner for him suitably to his destiny for this is what we mean when we say that things are suitable to us as the workmen say of squared stones in walls or the pyramids that they are suitable when they fit them to one another in some kind of connection for there is altogether one fitness harmony and as the universe is made up out of all bodies to be such a body as it is so out of all existing causes necessity destiny is made up to be such a cause as it is and even those who are completely ignorant understand what i mean for they say it necessity destiny brought this to such a person this then was brought and this was prescribed to him let us then receive these things as well as those which aesculapius prescribes many as a matter of course even among his prescriptions are disagreeable but we accept them in the hope of health let the perfecting 
and accomplishment of the things which the common nature judges to be good be judged by thee to be of the same kind as thy health and so accept everything which happens even if it seem disagreeable because it leads to this to the health of the universe and to the prosperity and felicity of zeus the universe for he would not have brought on any man what he has brought if it were not useful for the whole neither does the nature of anything whatever it may be cause anything which is not suitable to that which is directed by it for two reasons then it is right to be content with that which happens to thee the one because it was done for thee and prescribed for thee and in a manner had reference to thee originally from the most ancient causes spun with thy destiny and the other because even that which comes severally to every man is to the power which administers the universe a cause of felicity and perfection nay even of its very continuance for the integrity of the whole is mutilated if thou cuttest off anything whatever from the conjunction and the continuity either of the parts or of the causes and thou dost cut off as far as it is in thy power when thou art dissatisfied and in a manner triest to put anything out of the way be not disgusted nor discouraged nor dissatisfied if thou dost not succeed in doing everything according to right principles but when thou hast failed return back again and be content if the greater part of what thou doest is consistent with man's nature and love this to which thou returnest and do not return to philosophy as if she were a master but act like those who have sore eyes and apply a bit of sponge and egg or as another applies a plaster or drenching with water for thus thou wilt not fail to obey reason and thou wilt repose in it and remember that philosophy requires only the things which thy nature requires but thou wouldst have something else which is not according to nature it may be objected why what is more agreeable than this which i am doing but is not this the very reason why pleasure deceives us and consider if magnanimity freedom simplicity equanimity piety are not more agreeable for what is more agreeable than wisdom itself when thou thinkest of the security and the happy course of all things which depend on the faculty of understanding and knowledge things are in such a kind of envelopment that they have seemed to philosophers not a few nor those common philosophers altogether unintelligible nay even to the stoics themselves they seem difficult to understand and all our assent is changeable for where is the man who never changes carry thy thoughts then to the objects themselves and consider how short-lived they are and worthless and that they may be in the possession of a filthy wretch or a whore or a robber then turn to the morals of those who live with thee and it is hardly possible to endure even the most agreeable of them to say nothing of a man being hardly able to endure himself in such darkness then and dirt and in so constant a flux both of substance and of time and of motion and of things moved what there is worth being highly prized or even an object of serious pursuit i cannot imagine but on the contrary it is a man's duty to comfort himself and to wait for the natural dissolution and not to be vexed at the delay but to rest in these principles only the one that nothing will happen to me which is not conformable to the nature of the universe and the other that it is in my power never to act contrary to my god and demon for there is no man who will compel me to do this about what am i now employing my own soul 
on every occasion I must ask myself this question and inquire, what have I now in this part of me which they call the ruling principle? And whose soul have I now, that of a child or of a young man? or of a feeble woman, or of a tyrant, or of a domestic animal, or of a wild beast. What kind of things those are which appear good to the many, we may learn even from this. For if any man should conceive certain things as being really good, such as prudence, temperance, justice, fortitude, he would not, after having first conceived these, endure to listen to anything which should not be in harmony with what is really good. But if a man has first conceived as good the things which appear to the many to be good, he will listen and readily receive as very applicable that which was said by the comic writer. Thus even the many perceive the difference. For were it not so, this saying would not offend and would not be rejected in the first case while we receive it when it is said of wealth and of the means which further luxury and fame, as said fitly and wittily. Go on, then, and ask if we should value and think those things to be good, to which after their first conception in the mind the words of the comic writer might be aptly applied, that he who has them through pure abundance has not a place to ease himself in. I am composed of the formal and the material, and neither of them will perish into non-existence, as neither of them came into existence out of non-existence. Every part of me, then, will be reduced by change into some part of the universe, and that, again, will change into another part of the universe, and so on forever and by consequence of such a change I too exist, and those who begot me, and so on forever in the other direction. For nothing hinders us from saying so, even if the universe is administered according to definite periods of revolution. Reason and the reasoning art, philosophy, are powers which are sufficient for themselves and for their own works. They move, then, from a first principle which is their own, and they make their way to the end which is proposed to them. And this is the reason why such acts are named katorthoseis, or right acts, which word signifies that they proceed by the right road. None of these things ought to be called a man's which do not belong to a man, as man. They are not required of a man, nor does man's nature promise them, nor are they the means of man's nature attaining its end. Neither, then, does the end of man lie in these things, nor yet that which aids to the accomplishment of this end, and that which aids toward this end is that which is good. Besides, if any of these things did belong to man, it would not be right for a man to despise them and to set himself against them, nor would a man be worthy of praise who showed that he did not want these things, nor would he who stinted himself in any of them be good, if indeed these things were good. But now the more of these things a man deprives himself of, or of other things like them, or even when he is deprived of any of them, the more patiently he endures the loss, just in the same degree he is a better man. Such as are thy habitual thoughts, such also will be the character of thy mind. For the soul is dyed by the thoughts. Die it then with a continuous series of such thoughts as these. For instance, that where a man can live, there he can also live well. But he must live in a palace. Well then, he can also live well in a palace. And again, consider that for whatever purpose each thing has been constituted, for this it has been constituted, and toward this it is carried, and its end is in that toward which it is carried. And where the end is, there also is the advantage and the good of each thing. 
Now the good for the reasonable animal is society, for that we are made for society has been shown above. Is it not plain that the inferior exist for the sake of the superior? But the things which have life are superior to those which have not life, and of those which have life the superior are those which have reason. To seek what is impossible is madness, and it is impossible that the bad should not do something of this kind. Nothing happens to any man which he is not formed by nature to bear. The same things happen to another, and either because he does not see that they have happened, or because he would show a great spirit, he is firm and remains unharmed. It is a shame, then, that ignorance and conceit should be stronger than wisdom. Things themselves touch not the soul, not in the least degree, nor have they admission to the soul, nor can they turn or move the soul. But the soul turns and moves itself alone, and whatever judgments it may think proper to make, such it makes for itself the things which present themselves to it. In one respect man is the nearest thing to me, so far as I must do good to men and endure them. But so far as some men make themselves obstacles to my proper acts, man becomes to me one of the things which are indifferent, no less than the sun or wind or a wild beast. Now it is true that these may impede my action, but they are no impediments to my effects and disposition, which have the power of acting conditionally and changing. For the mind converts and changes every hindrance to its activity into an aid, and so that which is a hindrance is made a furtherance to an act, and that which is an obstacle on the road helps us on this road. Reverence that which is best in the universe. And this is that which makes use of all things and directs all things. And in like manner also reverence that which is best in thyself. And this is of the same kind as that. For in thyself also that which makes use of everything else is this, and thy life is directed by this. That which does no harm to the state does no harm to the citizen. In the case of every appearance of harm, apply this rule. If the state is not harmed by this, neither am I harmed. But if the state is harmed, thou must not be angry with him who does harm to the state. Show him where his error is. Often think of the rapidity with which things pass by and disappear, both the things which are and the things which are produced. For substance is like a river in a continual flow, and the activities of things are in constant change, and the causes work in infinite varieties, and there is hardly anything which stands still. And consider this which is near to thee, this boundless abyss of the past and of the future, in which all things disappear. How then is he not a fool who is puffed up with such things, or plagued about them, or makes himself miserable? For they vex him only for a time, and a short time. Think of the universal substance, of which thou hast a very small portion, and of universal time, of which a short and indivisible interval has been assigned to thee, and of that which is fixed by destiny and how small a part of it thou art. Does another do me wrong? Let him look to it. He has his own disposition, his own activity. I now have what the universal nature wills me to have, and I do what my nature now wills me to do. Let the part of thy soul which leads and governs be undisturbed by the movements in the flesh whether of pleasure or of pain, and let it not unite with them, but let it circumscribe itself and limit those effects to their parts. But when these effects rise up to the mind by virtue of that other sympathy that naturally exists in a body which is all one, then thou must not strive to resist the sensation, 
for it is natural. But let not the ruling part of itself add to the sensation the opinion that it is either good or bad. Live with the gods. And he does live with the gods who constantly shows to them that his own soul is satisfied with that which is assigned to him, and that it does all that the demon wishes, which Zeus have given to every man for his guardian and guide, a portion of himself. And this is every man's understanding and reason. Art thou angry with him whose armpits stink? Art thou angry with him whose mouth smells foul? What good will this anger do thee? He has such a mouth, he has such armpits. It is necessary that such an emanation must come from such things. But the man has reason, it will be said, and he is able, if he takes pains, to discover wherein he offends. I wish thee well of thy discovery. Well, then, and thou hast reason. By thy rational faculty, stir up his rational faculty. Show him his error, admonish him. For if he listens, thou wilt cure him, and there is no need of anger. As thou intendest to live when thou art gone out, so it is in thy power to live here. But if men do not permit thee, then get away out of life, yet so as if thou wert suffering no harm. The house is smoky, and I quit it. Why dost thou think that this is any trouble? But so long as nothing of the kind drives me out, I remain, am free, and no man shall hinder me from doing what I choose, and I choose to do what is according to the nature of the rational and social animal. The intelligence of the universe is social. Accordingly, it has made the inferior things for the sake of the superior, and it has fitted the superior to one another. Thou seest how it has subordinated, coordinated, and assigned to everything its proper portion, and has brought together into concord with one another the things which are the best. How hast thou behaved hitherto to the gods, thy parents, brethren, children, teachers, to those who looked after thy infancy, to thy friends, kinsfolk, to thy slaves. Consider if thou hast hitherto behaved to all in such a way that this may be said of thee. Never has wronged a man in deed or word. And call to recollection both how many things thou hast passed through and how many things thou hast been able to endure and that the history of thy life is now complete, and thy service is ended, and how many beautiful things thou hast seen, and how many pleasures and pains thou hast despised, and how many things called honorable thou hast spurned, and to how many ill-minded folks thou hast shown a kind disposition. Why do unskilled and ignorant souls disturb him who has skill and knowledge? What soul, then, has skill and knowledge? That which knows beginning and end, and knows the reason which pervades all substance, and through all time by fixed periods administers the universe. Soon, very soon, thou wilt be ashes, or a skeleton, and either a name or not even a name. But name is sound and echo, and the things which are much valued in life are empty and rotten and trifling, and like little dogs biting one another, and little children quarreling, laughing, and then straightway weeping. But fidelity and modesty and justice and truth are fled up to Olympus from the widespread earth. What then is there which still detains thee here? If the objects of sense are easily changed and never stand still, and the organs of perception are dull and easily receive false impressions, and the poor soul itself is an exhalation from blood. But to have good repute amid such a world as this is an empty thing. Why then dost thou not wait in tranquillity for thy end, whether it is extinction or removal to another state? And until that time comes, what is sufficient? Why, 
What else than to venerate the gods and bless them, and to do good to men, and to practice tolerance and self-restraint? But as to everything which is beyond the limits of the poor flesh and breath, to remember that this is neither thine nor in thy power. Thou canst pass thy life in an equable flow of happiness, if thou canst go by the right way, and think and act in the right way. These two things are common both to the soul of God and to the soul of man, and to the soul of every rational being, not to be hindered by another and to hold good to consist in the disposition to justice and the practice of it, and in this to let thy desire find its termination. If this is neither my own badness, nor an effect of my own badness, and the commonwealth is not injured, why am I troubled about it? And what is the harm to the commonwealth? Do not be carried along inconsiderately by the appearance of things, but give help to all according to thy ability and their fitness. And if they should have sustained loss in matters which are indifferent, do not imagine this to be a damage, for it is a bad habit. But as the old man, when he went away, asked back his foster child's top, remembering that it was a top, so do thou in this case also. When thou art calling out on the rostra, hast thou forgotten, man, what these things are? Yes, but they are objects of great concern to these people. Wilt thou too then be made a fool for these things? I was once a fortunate man, but I lost it, I know not how. But fortunate means that a man has assigned to himself a good fortune, and a good fortune is good disposition of the soul, good emotions, good actions. End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius by Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, translated by George Long. Chapter 6. The substance of the universe is obedient and compliant, and the reason which governs it has in itself no cause for doing evil, for it has no malice nor does it do evil to anything, nor is anything harmed by it. But all things are made and perfected according to this reason. Let it make no difference to thee whether thou art cold or warm, if thou art doing thy duty, and whether thou art drowsy or satisfied with sleep, and whether ill-spoken or praised, and whether dying or doing something else. For it is one of the acts of this life, this act by which we die. It is sufficient, then, in this act also to do well what we have in hand. Look within. Let neither the peculiar quality of anything nor its value escape thee. All existing things soon change, and they will either be reduced to vapor, if indeed all substance is one, or they will be dispersed. The reason which governs knows what its own disposition is, and what it does, and on what material it works. The best way of avenging thyself is not to become like the wrongdoer. Take pleasure in one thing and rest in it, in passing from one social act to another social act, thinking of God. The ruling principle is that which rouses and turns itself, and while it makes itself such as it is, and such as it wills to be, it also makes everything which happens to appear itself to be such as it wills. In conformity to the nature of the universe, every single thing is accomplished. For certainly it is not in conformity to any other nature that each thing is accomplished, either a nature which externally comprehends this, or a nature which is comprehended within this nature, or a nature external and independent of this. 
The universe is either a confusion and a mutual involution of things and a dispersion, or it is unity and order and providence. If, then, it is the former, why do I desire to tarry in a fortuitous combination of things in such a disorder? And why do I care about anything else than how I shall at last become earth? And why am I disturbed, for the dispersion of my elements will happen whatever I do? But if the other supposition is true, I venerate, and I am firm, and I trust in him who governs. When thou hast been compelled by circumstances to be disturbed in a manner, quickly return to thyself, and do not continue out of tune longer than the compulsion lasts, for thou wilt have more mastery over the harmony by continually recurring to it. If thou hadst a stepmother and a mother at the same time, thou wouldst be dutiful to thy stepmother, but thou wouldst constantly return to thy mother. Let the court and philosophy now be to thee stepmother and mother. Return to philosophy frequently and repose in her, through whom what thou meetest with in the court appears to thee tolerable, and thou appearest tolerable in the court. When we have meat before us and such eatables, we receive the impression that this is the dead body of a fish, and this is the dead body of a bird or of a pig, and again that this Falernian is only a little grape juice, and this purple robe some sheep's wool dyed with the blood of a shellfish. Such then are these impressions, and they reach the things themselves and penetrate them, and so we see what kind of things they are. Just in the same way ought we to act all through life, and where there are things which appear most worthy of our approbation, we ought to lay them bare, and look at their worthlessness, and strip them of all the words by which they are exalted. For outward show is a wonderful perverter of the reason, and when thou art most sure that thou art employed about things worth thy pains, it is then that it cheats thee most. Consider then what Crates says of Xenocrates himself. Most of the things which the multitude admire are referred to objects of the most general kind. Those which are held together by cohesion or natural organization, such as stones, wood, fig trees, vines, olives. But those which are admired by men, who are a little more reasonable, are referred to the things which are held together by a living principle, as flocks, herds. Those which are admired by men, who are still more instructed, are the things which are held together by a rational soul, not, however, a universal soul, but rational, so far as it is a soul skilled in some art, or expert in some other way, or simply rational so far as it possesses a number of slaves. But he who values a rational soul, a soul universal, and fitted for political life, regards nothing else except this, and above all things he keeps his soul in a condition and in an actively conformable to reason and social life, and he cooperates to this end with those who are of the same kind as himself. Some things are hurrying into existence, others are hurrying out of it, and of that which is coming into existence, part is already extinguished. Motions and changes are continually renewing the world, such as the uninterrupted course of time is always renewing the infinite duration of ages. In this flowing stream, then, on which there is no abiding, what is there of the things which hurry by on which a man would set a high price? It would be just as if a man should fall in love with one of the sparrows which fly by, but it is already passed out of sight. Something of this kind is the very life of every man, like the exhalation of the blood and the respiration of the air. Such as it is to once have drawn in the air and to have given it back, which we do every moment, just the same is it with the whole respiratory power which thou didst receive at thy birth yesterday and the day before, to give it back to the elemental from which thou didst first draw it. Neither is transpiration, as in plants, a thing to be valued, nor respiration, as in domesticated animals and wild beasts, nor the receiving of impressions by the appearances of things, nor being moved by desires, as puppets by strings, nor assembling in herds, nor being nourished by food. For this is just like the act of separating and parting with the useless part of the food. What, then, is worth being valued? To be received with clapping of hands? No. 
Neither must we value the clapping of tongues, for the praise which comes from the many is the clapping of tongues. Suppose, then, that thou hast given up this worthless thing called fame. What remains that is worth valuing? This, in my opinion, to move thyself and to restrain thyself in conformity to thy proper constitution, to which end both all employments and arts lead. For every art aims at this, that the thing which has been made should be adapted to the work for which it has been made. And both the vine planner who looks after the vine, and the horse breaker, and he who trains the dog, seeks this end. But the education and the teaching of youth aim at something. And this, then, is the value of the education and the teaching. And if this is well, thou wilt not seek anything else. Wilt thou not cease to value many other things, too? Then thou wilt neither be free, nor sufficient for thy own happiness, nor without passion. For of necessity thou must be envious, jealous, and suspicious of those who can take away those things, and plot against those who have that which is valued by thee. Of necessity a man must be altogether in a state of perturbation who wants any of these things, and besides he must often find fault with the gods. But to reverence and honor thy own mind will make thee content with thyself, and in harmony with society, and agreement with the gods, that is, praising all that they give and have ordered. Above, below, all around are the movements of the elements, but the motion of virtue is in none of these. It is something more divine, and advancing by a way hardly observed, it goes happily on its road. How strangely men act! They will not praise those who are living at the same time and living with themselves. But to be themselves praised by posterity, by those whom they have never seen or will ever see, this they set much value on. But this is very much the same as if thou shouldest be grieved because those who have lived before thee did not praise thee. If a thing is difficult to be accomplished by thyself, do not think that it is impossible for man. But if anything is possible for man, and conformable to his nature, think that this can be attained by thyself too. In the gymnastic exercises, suppose that a man has torn thee with his nails, and by dashing against thy head has inflicted a wound. Well, we neither show any signs of vexation, nor are we offended, nor do we suspect him afterward as a treacherous fellow. And yet we are on our guard against him, not, however, as an enemy, nor with suspicion but we quietly get out of his way. Something like this let their behavior be in all other parts of life. Let us overlook many things in those who are like antagonists in the gymnasium. For it is in our power, as I said, to get out of the way and to have no suspicion or hatred. If a man is able to convince me and show me that he do not think or act right, I will gladly change, for I seek the truth by which no man was ever injured, but he is injured who abides in his error and ignorance. I do my duty. Other things trouble me not, for they are either things without life, or things without reason, or things that have rambled and know not the way. As to the animals which have no reason, and generally all things and objects, do thou, since thou hast reason, and they have none, make use of them with a generous and liberal spirit. But towards human beings, as they have reason, behave in a social spirit. And on all occasions call on the gods, and do not perplex thyself about the length of time in which thou shalt do this, for even three hours so spent are sufficient. Alexander, the Macedonian, and his groom by death were brought to the same state. For either they were received among the same seminal principles of the universe, or they were alike dispersed among the atoms. Consider how many things in the same indivisible time take place in each of us, things which concern the body and things which concern the soul. And so, thou will not wonder if many more things, or rather all things which come into existence, in that which is the one and all which we call cosmos, exist in it at the same time. If any man should propose to thee the question, how the name Antoninus is written, wouldst thou with the straining of the voice utter each letter? What then if they grow angry? Wilt thou grow angry too? Wilt thou not go on with composure and number every letter? Just so, then, is this life. Also remember 
that every duty is made up of certain parts. These it is thy duty to observe, and without being disturbed or showing anger towards those who are angry with thee, to go on thy way and finish that which is set before thee. How cruel it is not to allow men to strive after the things which appear to them to be suitable to thy nature and profitable. Yet in a manner thou dost not allow them to do this, when thou art vexed because they do wrong. For they are certainly moved towards the things which they suppose them to be suitable to their nature and profitable to them. But it is not so. Teach them then, and show them without being angry. Death is the cessation of the impression through the senses, and of the pulling of the strings which move the appetites, and of the discursive movements of the thoughts, and of the service to the flesh. It is a shame for the soul to be the first to give way in this life, when thy body does not give way. Take care that thou art not made into a Caesar, that thou art not dyed with this dye, for such things happen. Keep thyself then simple, good, pure, serious, free from affectation, a friend of justice, a worshipper of the gods, kind, affectionate, strenuous in all proper acts. Strive to continue to be such as philosophy wish to make thee. Reverence the gods and help men. Short is life. There is only one fruit in this terrene life, a pious disposition and social acts. Do everything as a disciple of Antoninus. Remember his constancy in every act which was conformable to reason, and his evenness in all things, and his piety, and the serenity of his countenance, and his sweetness, and his disregard of empty fame, in his efforts to understand things, and how he would never let anything pass without having first most carefully examined it and clearly understood it, and how he bore with those who blamed him unjustly without blaming them in return, and how he did nothing in a hurry, and how he listened not to calumnies, and how exact an examiner of manners and actions he was, and not given to reproach people, nor timid, nor suspicious, nor a sophist, and with how little he was satisfied, such as lodging, bed, dress, food, servants, and how laborious and patient, and how he was able, on account of his sparing diet, to hold out to the evening without even requiring to relieve himself by any evacuations except at the usual hour, and with his firmness and uniformity in his friendships, and how he tolerated freedom of speech in those who opposed his opinions, and the pleasure that he had when any man showed him anything better, and how religious he was without superstition. Imitate all this that thou mayest have as good a conscience when thy last hour comes as he had. Return to thy sober senses and call thyself back. When thou hast roused thyself from sleep and hast perceived that they were only dreams which troubled thee, now in thy waking hours look at these, the things about thee, as thou didst look at those, the dreams. I consist of a little body and soul. Now to this little body all things are indifferent, for it is not able to perceive differences. But to the understanding those things only are indifferent, which are not the works of its own activity. But whatever things are the works of its own activity, all these things are in its power. And of these, however, only those which are done with reference to the present. For as to the future and the past activities of the mind, even these are for the present indifferent. Neither the labor which the hand does, nor that of the foot, is contrary to nature, so long as the foot does the foot's work, and the hand the hand's. So then neither to a man, as a man, is his labor contrary to nature, as long as he does the things of a man. But if the labor is not contrary to his nature, neither is it an evil to him. How many pleasures have been enjoyed by robbers, patricides, tyrants? Dost thou not see how the handicraftsmen accommodate themselves up to a certain point to those which are not skilled in their craft? Nevertheless, they cling to the reason, the principles of their art, and do not endure to depart from it. Is it not strange if the architect and the physician shall have more respect to the reason, the principles of their own arts, than man to his own reason, which is common to him and the gods? Asia, Europe, are corners of the universe, all the sea a drop in the universe, 
Athos, a little clod in the universe. All the present time is a point in eternity. All things are little, changeable, perishable. All things come from thence, from that universal ruling power, either directly proceeding or by way of sequence. And accordingly, the lion's gaping jaws, and that which is poisonous, and every harmful thing, as a thorn, as mud, are after-products of the grand and beautiful. Do not imagine, then, that they are of another kind from that which thou dost venerate, but form a just opinion of the source of all. He who has seen present things has seen all, both everything which has taken place from all eternity, and everything which will be for time without end. For all things are of one kin, and of one form. Frequently consider the connection of all things in the universe, and their relation to one another. For in a manner all things are implicated with one another, and all, in this way, are friendly to one another. For one thing comes in order after another, and this is by virtue of the active movement and mutual composition and the unity of the substance. Adapt thyself to the things with which thy lot has been cast, and the men among whom thou hast received thy portion. Love them, but do it truly. Every instrument, too, vessel if it does that for which it has been made is well and yet he who made it is not there but in all things which are held together by nature there is within and there abides in them the power which made them wherefore the more it is fit to reverence this power and to think that if thou dost live and act according to its will everything in thee is in conformity to intelligence and thus also in the universe the things which belong to it are in conformity to intelligence. Whatever of the things which are not within thy power thou shalt suppose to be good for thee or evil, it must of necessity be that, if such a bad thing befall thee, or the loss of such a good thing, thou wilt blame the gods, and hate men too, those who are the cause of the misfortune or the loss, or those who are suspected of being likely to be the cause. And indeed we do much injustice, because we make a difference between those things, because we do not regard these things as indifferent. But if we judge only those things which are in our power to be good or bad, there remains no reason either for finding fault with God or standing in a hostile attitude to man. We are all working together to one end, some with knowledge and design, and others without knowing what they do as men also when they are asleep, of whom it is Heraclius, I think, who says that there are laborers and cooperators in the things which take place in the universe. But men cooperate after different fashions, and even those cooperate abundantly who find fault with what happens, and those who try to oppose it and to hinder it. For the universe has need even of such men as these. It remains then for thee to understand among what kind of workmen thou placest thyself. For he who rules all things will certainly make a right use of thee, and he will receive thee among some part of the cooperators, and of those whose labors conduce to one end. But be not thou such a part as the mean and ridiculous verse in the play which Chrysippus speaks of. Does the sun undertake to do the work of the rain, or Aesculapius the work of the fruit-bearer? And how is it with respect to each of the stars? Are they not different, and yet they work together to the same end? If the gods have determined about me, and about the things which must happen to me, they have determined well, for it is not easy even to imagine a deity without forethought. And as to doing me harm, why should they have any desire towards that? For what advantage would result to them from this, or to the whole, which is the special object of their providence? But if they have not determined about me individually, they have certainly determined about the whole at least. And the things which happen by way of sequence in this general arrangement I ought to accept with pleasure, and to be content with them. But if they determine about nothing, which it is wicked to believe, or if we do believe it, let us neither sacrifice nor pray nor swear by them, nor do anything else which we do as if the gods were present and lived with us. But if, however, the gods determine about none of the things which concern us, I am able to determine about myself, and I can acquire about that which is useful, and that is useful to every man which is conformable to his own constitution and nature. 
but my nature is rational and social. In my city and country, as far as I am Antoninus, is Rome, but so far as I am a man, it is the world. The things, then, which are useful to these cities are alone useful to me. Whatever happens to every man, this is for the interest of the universal. This might be sufficient. But further thou wilt observe, this also is a general truth, if thou dost observe, that whatever is profitable to any man is profitable also to other men. But let the word profitable be taken here in the common sense, as said of things of the middle kind, neither good nor bad. As it happens to thee in the amphitheatre in such places, that the continual sight of the same things and the uniformity make the spectacle wearisome, so it is in the whole of life, for all things above, below, are the same and from the same. How long, then? Think continually that all kinds of men and all kinds of pursuits and of all nations are dead, so that thy thoughts come down even to Philistian and Phoebus and Oregonian. Now turn thy thoughts to the other kinds of men. To that place, then, we must remove where there are so many great orators, so many noble philosophers, Heraclitus, Pythagoras, Socrates, so many heroes of former days, and so many generals after them, and tyrants. Besides these, Eudoxus, Hipparchus, Archimedes, and other men of acute natural talents, great minds, lovers of labor, versatile, confident, mockers even of the perishable and ephemeral life of man, as Menippus and such as are like him. As to all these, consider that they have long been in the dust. What harm, then, is this to them? And what to those whose names are altogether unknown? One thing here is worth a great deal, to pass thy life in truth and justice, with a benevolent disposition even to liars and unjust men. Thou art not dissatisfied, I suppose, because thou weighest only so many leader, and not three hundred. Be not dissatisfied, then, that thou must live only so many years, and not more. For as thou art satisfied with the amount of substance which has been assigned to thee, so be content with the time. Let us try to persuade them, but act even against their will when the principles of justice lead that way. If, however, any man using force stands in thy way, betake thyself to contentment and tranquility and at the same time employ the hindrance toward the exercise of some other virtue. And remember that thy attempt was with a reservation, that thou didst not desire to do impossibilities. What, then, didst thou desire? Some such effort as this, but thou attainest thy object if the things to which thou wast move are accomplished. He who loves fame considers another man's activity to be his own good, and he who loves pleasure, his own sensations. But he who has understanding considers his own acts to be his own good. It is in our power to have no opinion about a thing, and not to be disturbed in our soul, for things themselves have no natural power to form our judgments. Accustom thyself to attend carefully to what is said by another, and as much as it is possible be in the speaker's mind. That which is not good for the swarm, neither is it good for the bee. If sailors abuse the helmsman, or the sick the doctor, would they listen to anybody else? And how could the helmsman secure the safety of those in the ship, or the doctor, health of those whom he attends? How many together with whom I came into the world are already gone out of it? To the jaundiced, honey tastes bitter, and to those bitten by mad dogs, water causes fear, and to little children the ball is a fine thing. Why then am I angry? Dost thou think that a false opinion has less power than the bile in the jaundiced, or the poison in him who is bitten by a mad dog? No man will hinder thee from living according to the reason of thy nature. Nothing will happen to the country to the reason of the universal nature. What kind of people are those whom men wish to please, and for what objects, 
and by what kinds of acts. How soon time will cover all things, and how many it has covered already. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius by Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. Translated by George Long. Chapter Seven. What is Badness? It is that which thou hast often seen, and on the occasion of everything which happens, keep this in mind, that it is that which thou hast often seen. Everywhere up and down thou wilt find the same things, with which the old histories are filled, those of the Middle Ages and those of our own day, with which cities and houses are filled now. There is nothing new. All things are both familiar and short-lived. 2. How can our principles become dead, unless the impressions, thoughts, which correspond to them are extinguished? But it is in thy power continuously to fan these thoughts into a flame. I can have that opinion about anything which I ought to have. If I can, why am I disturbed? The things which are external to my mind have no relation at all to my mind. Let this be the state of thy effects, and thou standest erect. To recover thy life is in thy power. Look at things again as thou didst use to look at them, for in this consists the recovery of thy life. 3. The idle business of show. Plays on the stage, flocks of sheep, herds, exercises with spears, a bone to cast to little dogs a bit of bread into fish ponds, laborings of ants and burden carrying, runnings about of frightened little mice, puppets pulled by strings, all alike. It is thy duty then in the midst of such things to show good humor and not a proud air, to understand, however, that every man is worth just so much as the things are worth about which he busies himself. 4. In discourse thou must attend to what is said, and in every movement thou must observe what is doing, and in the one thou shouldst see immediately to what end it refers. But in the other, watch carefully what is the thing signified. 5. Is my understanding sufficient for this or not? If it is sufficient, I use it for the work as an instrument given by the universal nature. But if it is not sufficient, then either I retire from the work and give way to him who is able to do it better, unless there be some reason why I ought not to do so, or I do it as well as I can, taking to help me the man who, with the aid of my ruling principle, can do what is now fit and useful for the general good. For whatsoever, either by myself or with another, I can do, ought to be directed to this only, to that which is useful and well suited to society. 6. How many after being celebrated by fame have been given up to oblivion, and how many who have celebrated the fame of others have long been dead? 7. Be not ashamed to be helped, for it is thy business to do thy duty like a soldier in the assault on a town. How then? If being lame thou canst not mount up on the battlements alone, but with the help of another, it is possible. 8. Let not future things disturb thee, for thou wilt come to them, if it shall be necessary, having with thee the same reason which now thou usest for present things. 9. All things are implicated with one another, and the bond is holy and there is hardly anything unconnected with any other thing. For things have been coordinated, and they combine to form the same universe, order. For there is one universe made up of all things, and one God who pervades all things, and one substance, 
and one law, one common reason in all intelligent animals, and one truth. If indeed there is also one perfection for all animals, which are of the same stock, and participate in the same reason. 10. Everything material soon disappears in the substance of the whole, and everything formal, causal, is very soon taken back into the universal reason, and the memory of everything is very soon overwhelmed in time. 11. To the rational animal the same act is according to nature and according to reason. 12. Be thou erect or be made erect. 13. Just as it is with the members in those bodies which are united in one, so it is with rational beings which exist separate, for they have been constituted for one cooperation, and the perception of this will be more apparent to thee if thou often sayest to thyself that I am a member of the system of rational beings. But if thou sayest that thou art a part, thou dost not yet love men from thy heart. Beneficence does not yet delight thee for its own sake. Thou still doest it barely as a thing of propriety, and not yet as doing good to thyself. 14. Let there fall externally what will on the parts which can feel the effects of this fall. For those parts which have felt will complain, if they choose. But I, unless I think that what has happened is an evil, am not injured, and it is in my power not to think so. 15. Whatever anyone does or says, I must be good, just as if the gold or the emerald or the purple were always saying this, whatever anyone does or says, I must be emerald and keep my color. 16. The ruling faculty does not disturb itself, I mean does not frighten itself or cause itself pain, but if anyone else can frighten or pain it, let him do so, for the faculty itself will not by its own opinion turn into such ways. Let the body itself take care, if it can, that it suffer nothing, and let it speak, if it suffers. But the soul itself, that which is subject to fear, to pain, which has completely the power of forming an opinion about these things, will suffer nothing, for it will never deviate into such a judgment. The leading principle in itself wants nothing, unless it makes a want for itself, and therefore it is both free from perturbation and unimpeded, if it does not disturb and impede itself. 17. Eudaimonia, happiness, is a good demon or a good thing. What then art thou doing here, O imagination? Go away, I entreat thee by the gods, as thou didst come, for I want thee not. But thou art come according to thy old fashion. I am not angry with thee, only go away. 18. Is any man afraid of change? Why, what can take place without change? What then is more pleasing or more suitable to the universal nature? And canst thou take a bath unless the wood undergoes a change? And canst thou be nourished unless the food undergoes a change? And can anything else that is useful be accomplished without change? Dost thou not see, then, that for thyself also to change is just the same, and equally necessary for the universal nature? 19. Through the universal substance, as through a furious torrent, all bodies are carried, being by their nature united with and cooperating with the whole, as the parts of our body with one another. How many a Chrysippus, how many a Socrates, how many an Epictetus has time already swallowed up? And let the same thought occur to thee with reference to every man and thing. 20. One thing only troubles me, lest I should do something which the constitution of man does not allow, or in the way which it does not allow, or what it does not allow now. 21. Near is thy forgetfulness of all things, and near the forgetfulness of thee by all. 
22. It is peculiar to man to love even those who do wrong. And this happens, if when they do wrong it occurs to thee that they are kinsmen, and that they do wrong through ignorance and un unintentionally, and that soon both of you will die, and above all, that the wrongdoer has done thee no harm, for he has not made thy ruling faculty worse than it was before. 23. The universal nature out of the universal substance, as if it were wax, now molds a horse, and when it has broken this up, it uses the material for a tree, then for a man, then for something else. And each of these things subsists for a very short time, but it is no hardship for the vessel to be broken up, just as there was none in its being fastened together. 24. A scowling look is altogether unnatural. When it is often assumed, the result is that all comeliness dies away, and at last is so completely extinguished that it cannot be again lighted up at all. Try to conclude from this very fact that it is contrary to reason. For if even the perception of doing wrong shall depart, what reason is there for living any longer? 25. Nature which governs the whole will soon change all things which thou seest, and out of their substance will make other things, and again other things from the substance of them, in order that the world may ever be new. 26. When a man has done thee any wrong, immediately consider with what opinion about good or evil he has done wrong. For when thou hast seen this, thou wilt pity him, and wilt neither wonder nor be angry. For either thou thyself thinkest the same thing to be good that he does, or another thing of the same kind. It is thy duty then to pardon him. But if thou dost not think such things to be good or evil, thou wilt more readily be well disposed to him who is in error. 27. Think not so much of what thou hast not, as of what thou hast. But of the things which thou hast select the best, and then reflect how eagerly they would have been sought, if thou hadst them not. At the same time, however, Take care that thou dost not, th through being so pleased with them, accustom thyself to overvalue them, so as to be disturbed if ever thou shouldst not have them. 28. Retire into thyself. The rational principle which rules has this nature, that it is content with itself when it does what is just, and so secures tranquility. 29. Wipe out the imagination, stop the pulling of the strings, confine thyself to the present, understand well what happens either to thee or to another, divide and distribute every object into the causal, formal, and the material, think of thy last hour, let the wrong which is done by a man stay there where the wrong was done. 30. Direct thy attention to what is said. Let thy understanding enter into the things that are doing, and the things which do them. 31. Adorn thyself with simplicity and modesty, and with indifference toward the things which lie between virtue and vice. Love mankind. Follow God. The poet says that law rules all, and it is enough to remember that law rules all. 32. About death, whether it is a dispersion, or a resolution into atoms, or annihilation, it is either extinction or change. 33. About pain, the pain which is intolerable carries us off, but that which lasts a long time is tolerable, and the mind maintains its own tranquility by retiring into itself and the ruling faculty is not made worse. But the parts which are harmed by pain, let them, if they can, give their opinion about it. 34. About fame. Look at the minds of those who seek fame. 
observe what they are, and what kind of things they avoid, and what kind of things they pursue, and consider that as the heaps of sand piled on one another hide the former sands. So in life the events which go before are soon covered by those which come after. 35. From Plato. The man who has an elevated mind and takes a view of all time and of all substance, dost thou suppose it possible for him to think that human life is anything great? It is not possible, he said. Such a man, then, will think that death also is no evil. Certainly not. 36. From Antisthenes. It is royal to do good and to be abused. 37. It is a base thing for the countenance to be obedient and to regulate and compose itself as the mind commands, and for the mind not to be regulated and composed by itself. 38. It is not right to vex ourselves at things, for they care not about it. 39. To the immortal gods and us give joy. 40. Life must be reaped like the ripe ears of corn. One man is born, another dies. 41. If gods care not for me and for my children, there is a reason for it. 42. For the good is with me, and the just. 43. No joining others in their wailing, no violent emotion. 44. From Plato. But I would make this man a sufficient answer, which is this. Thou sayest not well, if thou thinkest that a man who is good for anything at all ought to compute the hazard of life or death, and should not rather look to this only in all that he does, whether he is doing what is just or unjust, and the works of a good or a bad man. 45. For thus it is, men of Athens, in truth, wherever a man has placed himself thinking it the best place for him, or has been placed by a commander, there, in my opinion, he ought to stay, and to abide the hazard, taking nothing into the reckoning, either death or anything else, before the baseness of deserting his post. 46. But, my good friend, reflect whether that which is noble and good is not something different from saving and being saved. For as to a man living such or such a time, at least one who is really a man, consider if this is not a thing to be dismissed from the thoughts, and there must be no love of life. But as to these matters, a man must entrust them to the deity, and believe that what the women say, that no man can escape his destiny, the next inquiry being how he may best live the time that he has to live. 47. Look round at the courses of the stars, as if thou wert going along with them, and constantly consider the changes of the elements into one another, for such thoughts purge away the filth of the terrene life. 48. This is a fine saying of Plato, that he who is discoursing about men should look also at earthly things as if he viewed them from some higher place, should look at them in their assemblies, armies, agricultural labors, marriages, treaties, births, deaths, noise of the courts of justice, desert places, various nations of barbarians, feasts, lamentations, markets, a mixture of all things, and an orderly combination of contraries. 49. Consider the past, such great changes of political supremacies. Thou mayest foresee also the things which will be, for they will certainly be of like form, and it is not possible that they should deviate from the order of the things which take place now. Accordingly, to have contemplated human life for forty years is the same as to have contemplated it for ten thousand years. 
for what more wilt thou see? 50. That which has grown from the earth to the earth, but that which has sprung from heavenly seed back to the heavenly realms returns. This is either a dissolution of the mutual involution of the atoms, or a similar dispersion of the insentient elements. 51. With food and drinks and cunning magic arts, turning the channel's course to escape from death, the breeze which heaven has sent, we must endure and toil without complaining. 52. Another may, may be more expert in casting his opponent, but he is not more social, nor more modest, nor better disciplined to meet all that happens, nor more considerate with respect to the faults of his neighbors. 53. Where any work can be done conformably to the reason which is common to gods and men, there we have nothing to fear, for where we are able to get profits by means of the activity which is successful and proceeds according to our constitution, there no harm is to be suspected. 54. Everywhere and at all times it is in thy power piously to acquiesce in thy present condition, and to behave justly to those who are about thee, and to exert thy skill upon thy present thoughts that nothing shall steal into them without being well examined. 55. Do not look around thee to discover other men's ruling principles, but look straight to this, to what nature leads thee, both the universal nature through the things which happen to thee, and thy own nature through the acts which must be done by thee. But every being ought to do that which is according to its constitution and all other things have been constituted for the sake of rational beings, just as among irrational things the inferior for the sake of the superior, but the rational for the sake of one another. The prime principle, then, in man's constitution is the social, and the second is not to yield to the persuasions of the body, for it is the peculiar office of the rational and intelligent motion to circumscribe itself and never to be overpowered, either by the motion of the senses or of the appetites, for both are animal. But the intelligent motion claims superiority, and does not permit itself to be overpowered by the others, and with good reason, for it is formed by nature to use all of them. The third thing in the rational constitution is freedom from error and from deception. Let, then, the ruling principle holding fast to these things go straight on, and it has what is its own. 56. Consider thyself to be dead, and to have completed thy life up to the present time, and live according to nature the remainder which is allowed to thee. 57. Love that only which happens to thee, and is spun with the thread of thy destiny, for what is more suitable? 58. In everything which happens, keep before thy eyes those to whom the same things happened, and how they were vexed, and treated them as strange things, and found fault with them. And now where are they? Nowhere. Why then dost thou too choose to act in the same way? And why dost thou not leave these agitations which are foreign to nature, and those who cause them, and those who are moved by them? And why art thou not altogether intent upon the right way of making use of the things which happen to thee? For then thou wilt use them well, and they will be a material for thee to work on. Only attend to thyself, and resolve to be a good man in every act which thou doest, and remember. 59. Look within. Within is the fountain of good, and it will ever bubble up, if thou wilt ever dig. 60. The body ought to be compact, and to show no irregularity either in motion or attitude, for what the mind shows in the face by maintaining in it the expression of intelligence and propriety, that ought to be required also in the whole body. But all these things should be observed without affectation. 
61. The art of life is more like the wrestler's art than the dancer's, in respect of this, that it should stand ready and firm to meet onsets which are sudden and unexpected. 62. Constantly observe who those are whose approbation thou wishest to have, and what ruling principles they possess. For then thou wilt neither blame those who offend involuntarily, nor wilt thou want their approbation, if thou lookest to the sources of their opinions and appetites. 63. Every soul, the philosopher says, is involuntarily deprived of truth. Consequently, in the same way, it is deprived of justice and temperance and benevolence and everything of the kind. It is most necessary to bear this constantly in mind, for thus thou wilt be more gentle towards all. 64. In every pain let this thought be present, that there is no dishonor in it, nor does it make the governing intelligence worse, for it does not damage the intelligence either so far as the intelligence is rational or so far as it is social. Indeed, in the case of most pains, let this remark of Epicurus aid thee, that pain is neither intolerable nor everlasting. If thou bearest in mind that it has limits, and if thou addest nothing to it in imagination, and remember this too, that we do not perceive that many things which are disagreeable to us are the same as pain, such as excessive drowsiness, and the being scorched by heat, and the having no appetite. When then thou art discontented about any of these things, say to thyself that thou art yielding to pain. 65. Take care not to feel towards the inhuman as they feel towards men. 66. How do we know if Telogus was not superior in character to Socrates? For it is not enough that Socrates dies a more noble death, and disputed more skillfully with the sophists, and passed the night in the cold with more endurance, and that when he was bid to arrest Leon of Salamis, he considered it more noble to refuse and that he walked in a swaggering way in the streets, though as to this fact one may have great doubts if it was true. But we ought to inquire what kind of a soul it was that Socrates possessed, and if he was able to be content with being just towards men and pious towards the gods, neither idly vexed on account of men's villainy, nor yet making himself a slave to any man's ignorance nor receiving as strange anything that fell to his share out of the universal, nor enduring it as intolerable, nor allowing his understanding to sympathize with the effects of the miserable flesh. 67. Nature has not so mingled the intelligence with the composition of the body, as not to have allowed thee the power of circumscribing thyself, and of bringing under subjection to thyself all that is, in, that is thy own. For it is very possible to be a divine man, and to be recognized as such by no one. Always bear this in mind. And another thing, too, that very little indeed is necessary for living a happy life. And because thou hast despaired of becoming a dialectician, and skilled in the knowledge of nature, do not for this reason renounce the hope of being both free and modest and social and obedient to God. 68. It is in thy power to live free from all compulsion in the greatest tranquility of mind, even if all the world cry out against thee as much as they choose, and even if wild beasts tear in pieces the members of this needed matter which has grown around thee. For what hinders the mind in the midst of all this from maintaining itself in tranquillity, and in a just judgment of all surrounding things, and in a ready use of the objects which are presented to it, so that the judgment may say to the thing which falls under its observation, This thou art in substance, though in men's opinion thou mayest appear to be of a different kind, and the use shall say to that which falls under the hand, 
Thou art the thing that I was seeking. For to me that which presents itself is always a material for virtue, both rational and political, and, in a word, for the exercise of art, which belongs to man or God. For everything which happens has a relationship either to God or man, and is neither new nor difficult to handle, but usual and apt matter to work on. 69. The perfection of moral character consists in this, in passing every day as the last, and in being neither violently excited, nor torpid, nor playing the hypocrite. 70. The gods who are immortal are not vexed because during so long a time they must tolerate continually men as such as they are, and so many of them bad. And besides this, they also take care of them in all ways. But thou, who art destined to end so soon, art thou wearied of enduring the bad? And this too when thou art one of them? 71. It is a ridiculous thing for a man not to fly from his own badness, which is indeed possible, but to fly from other men's badness, which is impossible. 72. Whatever the rational and political faculty finds to be neither intelligent nor social, it properly judges to be inferior to itself. 73. When thou hast done a good act, and another hast received it, why dost thou still look for a third thing besides these, as fools do, either to have the reputation of having done a good act, or to obtain a return? 74. No man is tired of receiving what is useful, but it is useful to act according to nature. Do not then be tired of receiving what is useful by doing it to others. 75. The nature of the all moved to make the universe, but now either everything that takes place comes by way of consequence or continuity, or even the chief things towards which the ruling power of the universe directs its own movement are governed by no rational principle. If this is remembered, it will make thee more tranquil in many things. Note 1. The end of this section is unintelligible. End of chapter 7. Chapter 8 of Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Father Ziley of Detroit, Michigan. The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius by Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. Translated by George Long. Chapter 8. This reflection also tends to the removal of the desire of empty fame, that it is no longer in thy power to have lived the whole of thy life, or at least thy life from thy youth upwards, like a philosopher. But both to many others and to thyself it is plain that thou art far from philosophy. Thou hast fallen into disorder then, so that it is no longer easy for thee to get the reputation of a philosopher and thy plan of life also opposes it. If, then, thou hast truly seen where the matter lies, throw away the thought. How thou shalt seem to others, and be content if thou shalt live the rest of thy life in such wise as thy nature wills. Observe, then, what it wills, and let nothing else distract thee. For thou hast had experience of many wanderings without having found happiness anywhere not in syllogisms, nor in wealth, nor in reputation, nor in enjoyment, nor anywhere. Where is it then? In doing what man's nature requires. How then shall a man do this? 
if he has principles from which come his effects and his acts. What principles? Those which relate to good and bad. The belief that there is nothing good for man which does not make him just, temperate, manly, free, and that there is nothing bad which does not do the contrary to what has been mentioned. On the occasion of every act, ask thyself, How is this with respect to me? Shall I repent of it? A little time and I am dead, and all is gone. What more do I seek? If what I am doing now is the work of an intelligent living being, and a social being, and one who is under the same law with God. Alexander and Caius and Pompeius, what are they in comparison with Diogenes and Heraclitus and Socrates? For they were acquainted with things, and their causes, forms, and their matter, and the ruling principles of these men were the same, or conformable to their pursuits. But as to the others, how many things had they to care for, and to how many things were they slaves? Consider that men will do the same things nevertheless, even though thou shouldst burst. This is the chief thing. Be not perturbed, for all things are according to the nature of the universal. And in a little time thou wilt be nobody and nowhere, like Hadrianus and Augustus. In the next place, having fixed thy eyes steadily on thy business, look at it. And at the same time, remembering that it is thy duty to be a good man, and what man's nature demands, do that without turning aside, and speak as it seems to thee most just. Only let it be with a good disposition, and with modesty, and without hypocrisy. The nature of the universal has this work to do, to remove to that place the things which are in this, to change them, to take them away hence, and to carry them there. All things are change, yet we need not fear anything new. All things are familiar to us, but the distribution of them still remains the same. Every nature is contented with itself when it goes on its way well, and a rational nature goes on its way well when in its thoughts it assents to nothing false or uncertain, and when it directs its movements to social acts only, and when it confines its desires and aversions to the things which are in its power, and when it is satisfied with everything that is assigned to it by the common nature. For of this common nature, every particular nature is a part, as the nature of the leaf is a part of the nature of the plant, except that in the plant the nature of the leaf is part of a nature which has not perception or reason, and is subject to be impeded. But the nature of man is part of a nature which is not subject to impediments, and is intelligent and just, since it gives to everything in equal portions, and according to its worth, times, substance, cause, form, activity, and incident but examine not to discover that any one thing compared with any other single thing is equal in all respects, but by taking all the parts together of one thing and comparing them with all the parts together of another. Thou hast not leisure or ability to read, but thou hast leisure or ability to check arrogance. Thou hast leisure to be superior to pleasure and pain. Thou hast leisure to be superior to love of fame, and not to be vexed at stupid and ungrateful people, nay, even to care for them. Let no man any longer hear thee finding fault with the court life or with thy own.
Repentance is a kind of self-reproof for having neglected something useful. But that which is good must be something useful, and the perfect good man should look after it. But no such man would ever repent of having refused any sensual pleasure. Pleasure, then, is neither good nor useful. This thing, what is it in itself? in its own constitution? What is its substance and material? And what its causal nature or form? And what is it doing in the world? And how long does it subsist? When thou risest from sleep with reluctance, remember that it is according to thy constitution and according to human nature to perform social acts. But sleeping is common also to irrational animals. But that which is according to each individual's nature is also more peculiarly its own, and more suitable to its nature, and indeed also more agreeable. Constantly, and, if it be possible, on the occasion of every impression on the soul, apply to it the principles of physic, of ethic, of dialectic. Whatever man thou meetest with, immediately say to thyself, What opinions has this man about good and bad? For it, with respect to pleasure and pain, and the causes of each, and with respect to famine and ignominy, death and life, he has such and such opinions, it will seem nothing wonderful or strange to me if he does such and such things, and I shall bear in mind that he is compelled to do so. Remember that as it is a shame to be surprised if the fig tree produces figs, so it is to be surprised if the world produces such and such things of which it is productive. And for the physician and the helmsman, it is a shame to be surprised if a man has a fever, or if the wind, if unfavorable. Remember that to change thy opinion and to follow him who corrects thy error is as consistent with freedom as it is to persist in thy error, for it is thy own, the activity which is exerted according to thy own movement and judgment, and indeed according to thy own understanding, too. If a thing is in thy own power, why dost thou do it? But if it is in the power of another, whom dost thou blame? The atoms, chance, or the gods? Both are foolish. Thou must blame nobody. For if thou canst correct what is the cause, but if thou canst not do this, correct at least the thing itself. But if thou canst not do even this, of what use it to thee to find fault? For nothing should be done without a purpose. That which has died falls not out of the universe. If it stays here, it also changes here, and is dissolved into its proper parts, which are elements of the universe and of thyself. And these too change, and they murmur not. Everything exists for some end. A horse, a vine. Why dost thou wonder? Even the sun will say, I am for some purpose. And the rest of the gods will say the same. For what purpose then art thou? To enjoy pleasure? See if common sense allows this. Nature has had regard in everything no less to the end than to the beginning, and the continuance, just like the man who throws up a ball. What good is it then for the ball to be thrown up? or harm for it to come down, or even to have fallen? And what good is it to the bubble while it holds together, or what harm when it is burst? The same may be said of a light also. Turn it, the body, 
inside out and see what kind of thing it is, and when it has grown old, what kind of thing it becomes, and when it is diseased. Short-lived are both the praiser and the praised, and the rememberer and the remembered, and all this in a nook of this part of the world, and not even here do all agree, no, not any one with himself, and the whole earth too is a point. Attend to the matter which is before thee, whether it is an opinion or an act or a word. Thou sufferest this justly, for thou choosest rather to become good tomorrow than to be good today. Am I doing anything? I do it with reference to the good of mankind. Does anything happen to me? I receive it and refer it to the gods, and the source of all things, from which all that happens is derived. Such as bathing appears to thee, oil, sweat, dirt, filthy water, all things disgusting, so is every part of life and everything. Lucilla saw Varus die and then Lucilla died. Secunda saw Maximus die, and then Secunda died. Epitechanus saw Diotimus die, and then Epitechanus died. Antoninus saw Faustina die, and then Antoninus died. Such is everything. Kaler saw Hadrianus die, and then Kaler died. And those sharp-witted men, either seers or men inflated with pride, where are they? For instance, the sharp-witted men, Charax and Demetrius, the Platonist, and Eudaimon, and anyone else like them, all ephemeral, dead long ago. Some indeed have not been remembered even for a short time, and others have become the heroes of fables, and again others have disappeared even from fables. Remember this then, that this little compound thyself must either be dissolved, or thy poor breath must be extinguished, or be removed and placed elsewhere. It is satisfaction to a man to do the proper works of a man. Now it is a proper work of a man to be benevolent to his own kind to despise the movements of the senses, to form a just judgment of plausible appearances, and to take a survey of the nature of the universe and of the things which happen in it. There are three relations between thee and other things, the one to the body which surrounds thee, the other to the divine cause from which all things come to all, and the third to those who live with thee. Pain is either an evil to the body, then let the body say what it thinks of it, or to the soul. But it is in the power of the soul to maintain its own serenity and tranquility, and not to think that pain is an evil. For every judgment and movement and desire and aversion is within and no evil ascends so high. Wipe out thy imaginations by often saying to thyself, Now it is in my power to let no badness be in this soul, nor desire, nor any perturbation at all. But looking at all things, I see what is their nature, and I use each according to its value. Remember this power which thou hast from nature. Speak both in the Senate and to every man, whoever he may be, appropriately, not with any affectation. Use plain discourse. Augustus' court, wife, daughter, descendants, ancestors, sister, Agrippa, kinsmen, intimates, 
friends, Arius, Machinus, physicians, and sacrificing priests. The whole court is dead. Then turn to the rest, not considering the death of a single man, but of a whole race, as of the Pompeii, and that which is inscribed on the tombs, the last of his race. Then consider what trouble those before them have had, that they might leave a successor, and then that of necessity someone must be the last. Again, here consider the death of a whole race. It is thy duty to order thy life well in every single act, and if every act does its duty, as far as is possible, be content, and no one is able to hinder thee, so that each act shall not do its duty. But something external will stand in the way. Nothing will stand in the way of thy acting justly and soberly and considerately, but perhaps some other active power will be hindered. Well, but by acquiescing in the hindrance, and by being content to transfer thy efforts to that which is allowed, another opportunity of action is immediately put before thee, in place of that which was hindered. And one will adapt itself to this ordering of which we are speaking. Receive wealth or prosperity without arrogance, and be ready to let it go. If thou didst ever see a hand cut off, or a foot, or a head, lying anywhere apart from the rest of the body, which does a man make himself, as far as he can, who is not content with what happens, and separates himself from others, or does anything unsocial? Suppose that thou hast detached thyself from the natural unity, for thou wast made by nature apart, but now thou hast cut thyself off. Yet here there is this beautiful provision, that it is in thy power again to unite thyself. God has allowed this to no other part, after it has been separated and cut asunder, to come together again. But consider the kindness by which he has distinguished man, for he has put it in his power not to be separated at all from the universal. And when he has been separated, he has allowed him to return and to be united and to resume his place as a part. As the nature of the universal has given to every rational being all the other powers that it has, so we have received from it this power also. For as the universal nature converts and fixes in its predestined place everything which stands in the way and opposes it, and makes such things a part of itself, so also the rational animal is able to make every hindrance its own material, and to use it for such purposes as it may have designed. Do not disturb thyself by thinking of the whole of thy life. Let not thy thoughts at once embrace all the various troubles which thou mayest expect to befall thee. But on every occasion ask thyself, What is there in this which is intolerable and past bearing? For thou wilt be ashamed to confess. In the next place remember that neither the future nor the past pains thee, but only the present. But this is reduced to a very little, if thou only circumscribest it, and chidest thy mind, if it is unable to hold out against even this. Does Panthea or Pergamus now sit by the tomb of Verus? Does Chaurius or Diomitus sit by the tomb of Hadrianus? That would be ridiculous. Well, suppose they did sit there, would the dead be conscious of it? And if the dead were conscious, would they be pleased? And if they were pleased, would that make them immortal? Was it not in the order of destiny that these persons should first become old women and old men, and then die? What then would do those do after these were dead? 
All this is foul smell and blood in a bag. If thou can see sharp, look and judge wisely, says the philosopher. In the constitution of the rational animal, I see no virtue which is opposed to justice. But I see a virtue which is opposed to love of pleasure, and that is temperance. If thou takest away thy opinion about that which appears to give thee pain, thou thyself standest in perfect security. Who is this self? The reason. But I am not reason. Be it so. Let then the reason itself not trouble itself. But if any other part of thee suffers, let it have its own opinion about itself. Hindrance to the perceptions of sense is an evil to the animal nature. Hindrance to the movements, desires, is equally an evil to the animal nature. And something else also is equally an impediment and evil to the constitution of plants. So then that which is a hindrance to the intelligence is an evil to the intelligent nature. Apply all these things to thyself. Does pain or sensuous pleasure affect thee? The senses will look to that. Has any obstacle opposed thee in thy efforts toward an object? If indeed thou wast making this effort absolutely, unconditionally, or without any reservation, certainly this obstacle is an evil to thee, considered as a rational animal. But if thou takest into consideration the usual course of things, Thou hast not yet been injured or even impeded. The things, however, which are proper to the understanding, no other man is used to impede. For neither fire, nor iron, nor tyrant, nor purse touches it in any way. When it has been made a sphere, it continues a sphere. It is not fit that I should give myself pain, for I have never intentionally given pain even to another. Different things delight different people, but it is my delight to keep the ruling faculty sound without turning either from any man or from any of the things which happen to men but looking at and receiving all with welcome eyes and using everything according to its nature. See that thou secure this present time to thyself, for those who rather pursue posthumous fame do not consider that the men of after time will be exactly such as these whom they cannot bear now, and both are mortal. And what is it? in any way to thee, if these men of after time utter this or that sound, or have this or that opinion about thee. Take me and cast me where thou wilt, for there I shall keep my divine part tranquil, that is, content if it can feel and act comfortably to its proper constitution. Is this change of place sufficient reason why man, my soul should be unhappy and worse than it was, depressed, expanded, shrinking, affrighted? And what wilt thou find which is sufficient reason for this? Nothing can happen to any man which is not human accident, nor to an ox which is not according to the nature of an ox, nor to vine which is not according to the nature of a vine nor to a stone which is not proper to a stone. If then there happens to each thing both what is usual and natural, why shouldst thou complain? For the common nature brings nothing which may not be borne by thee. If thou art pained by any external thing, it is not this that disturbs thee, but by thy own judgment about it and it is in thy power to wipe out this judgment now. But if anything in thy own disposition gives thee pain, who hinders thee from correcting thy opinion? And even if thou art pained because thou art not doing some particular thing which seems to thee to be right, why dost thou not rather act than complain? 
but some insuperable obstacle is in the way? Do not be grieved then, for the cause of its not being done depends not on thee, but it is not worth while to live. If this cannot be done, take thy departure then from life, contentedly, just as he dies who is in full activity, and well pleased to with the things which are obstacles. Remember that the ruling faculty is invincible. When self-collected, it is satisfied with itself. If it does nothing which it does not choose to do, even if it resist from mere obstinacy, what then will it be when it forms a judgment about anything aided by reason and deliberately? Therefore, the mind which is freedom from passions is a citadel. For man has nothing more secure to which he can fly for refuge and for the future to be inexpungible. He then who has not seen this is an ignorant man, but he who has seen it and does not fly to this refuge is unhappy. Say nothing more to thyself than what the first appearances report. Suppose that it has been reported to thee that a certain person speaks ill of thee. This has been reported, but that thou hast been injured, this has not been reported. I see that my child is sick, I do see, but that he is in danger, I do not see. Thus then always abide by the permanent appearances, and add nothing thyself from within, and when nothing happens to thee, or rather add something like a man who knows everything that happens in the world. A cucumber is bitter, throw it away. There are briars in the road, turn aside from them. This is enough. Do not add, and why were such things made in the world? For thou wilt be ridiculed by a man who is acquainted with nature, as thou wouldst be ridiculed by a carpenter and a shoemaker, if thou didst find fault, because thou seest in their workshops savings and cuttings from which they make. And yet they have places into which they can throw these shavings and cuttings, and the universal nature has no external space. But the wondrous part of her art is that, though she has circumscribed herself, everything within her which appears to decay and to grow old and to be useless, she changes into herself, and again makes new things from these very same, so that she requires neither substance from without, nor wants a place into which she may cast that which delays. She is content, then, with her own space, and her own matter, and her own heart. Neither in thy actions be sluggish, nor in thy conversation without method, nor wandering in thy thoughts, nor let there be in thy soul inward contention or external effusion nor in life be so busy as to leave no pleasure. Suppose that men kill thee, cut thee in pieces, curse thee. What then can these things do to prevent thy mind from remaining pure, wise, sober, just? For instance, if a man should stand by a limpid, pure spring and curse it, the spring never ceases setting up potable water. And if he should cast clay into it, or filth, it will speedily disperse them and wash them out, and will not be at all polluted. How then shall thou possess a perpetual fountain, and not a mere wall? By forming thyself hourly to freedom conjoined with contentment, simplicity, and modesty. He who does not know what the world is, does not know where he is, and he who does not know for what purpose the world exists, does not know who he is, nor what the world is. But he who has failed in any of these things could not even say for what purpose he exists himself. What then dost thou think of him who avoids or seeks the praise of those who applaud, of men who know not either where they are or who they are? Dost thou wish to be praised by a man who curses himself thrice every hour? Wouldst thou wish to please a man who does not please himself? Does a man please himself who repents of nearly everything that he does? 
No longer let thy breathing only act in concert with the air which surrounds thee, but let thy intelligence also now be in harmony with the intelligence which embraces all things. For the intelligent power is no less diffused in all parts and pervades all things from him who is willing to draw it to him than the aerial power for him who is able to respire it. Generally, wickedness does no harm at all to the universe, and particularly the wickedness of one man does no harm or another. It is only harmful to him who has it in his power to be released from it as soon as he shall choose. To my own free will, the free will of my neighbor is just as indifferent as his poor health and flesh. For though we are made especially for the sake of one another, Still, the ruling power of each of us has its own office, for otherwise my neighbor's wickedness would be my harm, which God has not willed in order that my unhappiness might not depend on another. The sun appears to be poured down, and in all directions indeed it is diffused, yet it is not diffused, for this diffusion is extension. Accordingly, its rays are called extensions, Greek, because they are extended, Greek. But one may judge what kind of a thing a ray is if he looks at the night's light passing through a narrow opening into a darkened room. For it is extended in a right line, and as it were is divided when it meets with any solid body which stands in the way and intercepts the air beyond. But there the light remains fixed and does not glide or fall. Such, then, ought to be the outpouring and affection of the understanding, and it should in no way be an effusion, but an extension, and it should make no violent or impetuous collision with the obstacles which are in its way, nor yet fall down, but be fixed and enlighten that which receives it. For a body will deprive itself of the illumination if it does not admit it. He who fears death either fears the loss of sensation or a different kind of sensation. But if thou shalt have no sensation, neither wilt thou feel any harm. And if thou shalt acquire another kind of sensation, thou wilt be a kind of living being who will not cease. Men exist for the sake of one another. Teach them then or bear with them. In one way an arrow moves, in another way the mind. The mind indeed, both when it exercises caution and when it is employed about iniquity, moves straight onward, not the less, and to its object. Enter into every man's ruling faculty, and also let every other man enter into thine. End of chapter 8. Recording by Father Ziley of Detroit, Michigan. June 2007.